Chapter 19 of the Book of Life by Upton Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 19 Experiments in Diet narrates the author's adventures in search of meat. Students of the body assure us that every particle of matter which composes it is changed in the course of seven years. It is obvious that everything that is a part of the body has at some time to be taken in as food. So the problem of our diet today is the problem of what our body shall consist of seven years from now, and probably a great deal sooner. I begin this discussion by telling my own personal experiences with food. I am not going to recommend my diet for anyone else, because one of the first things I have to say about the subject is that every human individual is a separate diet problem. But I am going to try to establish a few principles for your guidance, and more especially to point out the commonest mistakes. I tell about my own mistakes because it happens that I know them more intimately. I was brought up in the South, where it is the custom of people to give a great deal of time and thought to the subject of eating. Among the people I knew, it was always taken for granted that there should be at least one person in the kitchen devoting all her time to the preparing of delicious things for the family to eat. This person was generally a negress, and, needless to say, she knew nothing about the chemistry of foods nothing about their constituents or nutritive qualities. All she knew was about their taste. She had been trained to prepare them in ways that tasted best, and was continually being advised and exhorted and sometimes scolded by the ladies of the family on this subject. At the table, the family and the guests never failed to talk about the food and its taste. And, not infrequently, the cook would be behind the door listening to their comments or else she would wait until after the meal for the report which somebody would bring her. In addition to this, the ladies of the family were skilled in what is called fancy cooking. They did not bother with meats and vegetables, but they mixed batter cakes and made all kinds of elaborate desserts and exchanged these treasures and the recipes for them with other ladies in the neighborhood. In addition to this, there were certain periods of the week and of the year especially devoted to the preparing and consuming of great quantities of foods. Once every seven days, the members of the family expressed their worship of their creator by eating twice as much as usual. And at another time, they celebrated the birth of their Redeemer by overeating systematically for a period of two or three weeks. Needless to say, of course, the children brought up in such an environment all had large appetites and large stomachs, and their susceptibility to illness was recognized by the setting apart for them of a whole classification of troubles, children's diseases, they were called. In addition to children's diseases, there were coughs and colds and sore throats and pains in the stomach and constipation and diarrhea, which the children shared with their adults. I had a little more than my share of all these troubles. Always a doctor would be sent for, and always he was wise and impressive, and always I was impressed. He gave me some pills or a bottle of liquid, a teaspoonful every two hours, or something like that. I can hear the teaspoon rattle in the glass as I write. I had a profound respect for each and every one of those doctors. He was wisdom walking about in trousers, and whenever he came, I knew that I was going to get well, and I did, which proved the case completely. Then I grew up, and at the age of 18 or 19 became possessed of a desire for knowledge, and took to reading and studying literally every minute of the day and a good part of the night. I seldom let myself go to sleep before two o'clock in the morning, and was always up by seven and ready for work again. I did this for ten years or so until nature brought me to a complete stop. During these ten years, I was a regular experiment station in health. That is, I had every kind of common ailment, and had it over and over again, so that I could try all the ways of curing it, or failing to cure it, and kept on trying until I was sure, one way or the other. I came recently upon a wonderful saying by John Burroughs, 
which will be appreciated by every author. This writing is an unnatural business. It makes your head hot and your feet cold, and it stops the digesting of your food. This trouble with my digestion began when I was writing my second novel, camping out on a lonely island at the foot of Lake Ontario. I went to see a doctor in a nearby town, and he talked learnedly about dyspepsia. The cause of it, he said, was failure of the stomach to secrete enough pepsin, and the remedy was to take artificial pepsin obtained from the stomach of a pig. He gave me this pig pepsin in a bottle of red liquid, and I religiously took some after each meal. It helped for a time, but then I noticed that it helped less and less. I got so that a simple meal of cold meat and boiled potatoes would stay in my stomach for hours in spite of any amount of the pig pepsin. I would lie about in misery because I wanted to work, and my accursed stomach would not let me. All the time, of course, I was using my mind on this problem, groping for causes. I found that the trouble was worse if I worked immediately after eating. I found also that it was worse when I was writing books. When I got sufficiently desperate, I would stop writing books and go off on a hunting trip. I would tramp twenty miles a day over the mountains looking for deer, and I would come back at night too tired to think, and in a week or two every trace of my trouble would be gone. So my life regimen came to be, first the writing of a book, and then a hunting trip to get over the effects of it. But as time went on, alas, I noticed the recuperation was more slow and less certain. The working times grew shorter, the hunting times grew longer, until finally I got to a point where I couldn't work at all. I would go to pieces in a few days if I tried it. It was apparently the end of my stomach, and the end of my sleeping, and the end of my writing books. My teeth were decaying, not merely outside, but inside. I would have abscesses, and most frightful agonies to endure. I would lie awake at night, and it would seem to me that I could feel my body going to pieces, an extremely depressing sensation. I had been trying experiments all this time. I had been going to one doctor after another, and had got to realize that the doctors only treated symptoms. They treated the diseases when they appeared, but nobody ever told you how to keep the diseases from appearing. Why could there not be a doctor who would look you over thoroughly and tell you everything that was wrong with you and how to set it right? A doctor who would tell you exactly how to live so that you might keep well all the time. I was studying economics and becoming suspicious of my fellow man. It occurred to me that possibly it might be embarrassing to a doctor if he cured all his patients and taught them how to live so that none of them would ever come to him again. It occurred to me that possibly this might be the reason why preventive medicine, constructive health work, was getting so little attention from the medical fraternity. Two things that plagued me were headache and constipation, and they were obviously related. For constipation, the world had one simple remedy. You took something every night or every morning and thought no more about it. My stout and amiable grandmother had drunk a glass of Hunyadi water every morning for the last thirty or forty years, and that she finally died of fatty degeneration of the heart was not connected with this in the mind of anyone who knew her. As for headaches, people would tell you this, that, and the other remedy, and I would try them, and that is, unless they happened to be drugs. I was getting more and more shy of drugs. I had some blessed instinct which saved me from stimulants and narcotics. I had never used tea, coffee, alcohol, or tobacco, and in my worst periods of suffering I never took to putting myself to sleep with chloral or to stopping my headaches with phenacetin. At the end of six or eight years of purgatory I came upon a prospectus of the Battle Creek Sanitarium. This seemed to me exactly what I wanted. This was constructive. It dealt with the body as a whole. So I spent a couple of months at the sand and paid them something like a thousand dollars to tell me all they could about myself. The first thing they told me was that meat-eating was killing me. 
it was perfectly obvious was it not that meat is a horrible feeding place for germs that rotten meat is dreadfully offensive and likewise digested meat consider the excreta of cats for example i listened solemnly while dr kellogg read off the numbers of billions of bacteria per gram in the contents of the colon of a carnivorous person it certainly seemed proper that the author of the jungle should be a vegetarian so i became one and did my best to persuade myself that i enjoyed the taste of the patent meat substitutes which are served in hundred calorie portions in the big sanitarium dining room there also i met horace fletcher and learned to chew every particle of food thirty-two times and often more i exercised in the sanitarium gymnasium and watched the sterilized dancing the men with the men and the women with the women i was patiently polite with the seventh-day adventist religion and laid in a supply of postage stamps on friday evening finally and most important of all i went once a day to the treatment rooms and had my abdomen doctored alternately with hot cloths and ice by this means i kept up a flow of blood in the intestinal tract and stimulated these organs to activity so my constipation was relieved and my headaches were less severe so long as i stayed at the sanitarium and was boiled and frozen once every day but when i left the sanitarium and abandoned these treatments the troubles began to return meantime however i had written a book in the praise of vegetarianism a book which has got into the libraries and cannot be got out again i went on to a new variety of health crank the real nature cure practitioners vegetarianism was not enough they insisted the evil had begun long before when man first ruined his food and destroyed its nutritive value by means of fire there was only one certain road to health and that was by the raw food route the monkey and squirrel diet I had gone out to California for a winter's rest and decided I would give this plan a thorough trial. For five months I lived by myself, and the only cooked food I ate was shredded wheat biscuit. For the rest, I lived on nuts and salads and fresh and dried fruits, and during this period I enjoyed such health as I had never known in my life before. I had literally not a single ailment. I was not merely well, but bubbling over with health i had a friend who said it cheered him just to see me walk down the street i thought that it was entirely the raw food and that i had solved the problem forever but i overlooked the fact that during those five months i had done no hard brain work no writing i went back to writing again and things began to go wrong my wonderful raw foods took to making trouble in my stomach and i assure you that until you try you have no idea the amount of trouble that can be made in your stomach by a load of bananas and soaked prunes which had gone wrong for a year or two i agonized i could not give up my wonderful raw food diet because i had always before me the vision of those months in california and i could not understand why it was not that way again but the time came when i would eat a meal of raw food and for hours afterwards my stomach would feel like a blown-up football then somebody gave me a book by dr salisbury on the subject of the meat diet of all the horrible things in the world a meat diet sounded to me the worst i had been a vegetable enthusiast for three years and thought of eating meat as you would think of cannibalism but there has never been a time in my life when i could not hear something new and give it a trial if it sounded well so i read the books of dr salisbury which have long been out of print and have been curiously neglected by the medical profession salisbury was a real pioneer an experimenter he wrote in the days before the germ theory and so missed his guess regarding tuberculosis but he perceived that most of the common diseases are caused by dietetic errors and he set to work to prove it he showed that hog cholera and army diarrhea are the same disease and come from the same cause he took a squad of men 
and fed them on army biscuit for two or three weeks, until they were nearly dead, and then he put them on a diet of lean beef and completely cured them in a few days. He did the same thing with one kind of food after another, and in each case he would bring his men as near to death as he dared, and then he would cure them. He showed that meat is the only food which contains all the elements of nutrition, the only food upon which a person can live for an unlimited period. As Salisbury said, beef is first, mutton is second, and the rest nowhere. It was his idea that tuberculosis of the lungs is caused by spores of fermenting starch clogging the minute blood vessels. He claimed that there is an early stage of tuberculosis in which the spores are floating in the bloodstream. He put large numbers of patients upon a diet of lean beef, ground and cooked, and he cured them of tuberculosis. And if one of them would break the diet and yield to a craving for starch or sugar, Salisbury claimed that he could find it out an hour or two later by examining a drop of their blood under the microscope. In his books, he described vividly the effects of an excess of starch and sugar in the diet. He called it making a yeast pot of your stomach. And you can imagine how that hit my stomach, full of half-digested bananas and prunes. I tried the Salisbury diet and satisfied myself of this one fact that lean meat is for brain workers the most easily assimilated of all foods. Salisbury claimed that you could not overeat on meat, but I do not believe there is any food you cannot overeat on, nor do I believe that anyone should try to live on one kind of food. We are by nature omnivorous animals. Our digestive tracts are similar to those of hogs and monkeys, which eat all varieties of food they can get. One of the common errors of the nature cure enthusiast is to cite the monkey and the squirrel as fruit and nut eating animals, when the fact is that monkeys and squirrels eat meat when they can get it, and the ardor with which they go bird nesting is evidence enough that they crave it. If there is any race of man which is vegetarian, you will find that it is from necessity alone. The beautiful South Sea Islanders, who are the theme of the raw fooders' ecstasy, spend a lot of their time catching fish, and sometimes they kill a pig, and celebrate the event precisely as Christians celebrate the birth of their Redeemer. From this you may be able to guess my conclusions. As a result of much painful blundering and experimenting, so far as diet is concerned, I belong to no school. I have learned something from each one and what I have learned from a trial of them all is to be shy of extreme statements and of hard and fast rules. To my vegetarian friends who argue that it is morally wrong to take sentient life, I answer that they cannot go for a walk in the country without committing that offense, for they walk on innumerable bugs and worms. We cannot live without asserting our right to subject the lower forms of life to our purposes. We kill innumerable germs when we swallow a glass of grape juice, or for that matter, a glass of plain water. I shall be much surprised if the advance of science does not some day prove to us that there are rudimentary forms of consciousness in all vegetable life. So we shall justify the argument of Mr. Dooley, who said in reviewing the jungle, that he could not see why it was any less crime to cut off a young tomato in its prime, or to murder a whole cradle full of baby peas in the pod. There is no question that meat-eating is inconvenient, expensive, and dirty. I have no doubt that some day we shall know enough to be able to find for every individual a diet which will keep him at the top of his power, without the maintenance of the slaughterhouse. But we do not possess that knowledge at present. At least, I personally do not possess it. I happen to be one of those individuals. There are many of them with whom milk does not agree, and if you rule out milk and meat, you will find yourself compelled to get a great deal of your protein from vegetable sources, such as peas, beans, and nuts. All these contain a great deal of starch, and thus there is no way you can arrange your diet to escape an excess of starch. Excess of starch, so my experience has convinced me, is the deadliest of all dietetic errors. It is also the commonest of errors. 
the cause not merely of the common throat and nose infections, but of constipation, and likewise of diarrhea, of anemia, and thus through the weakening of the bloodstream of all disorders that spring from this source, decaying teeth and rheumatism, boils, bad complexion, and tuberculosis. Starch foods are the cheapest, therefore they form the common diet of the poor, and are responsible for the diseases of undernourishment to which the poor are liable. On the other hand, of course, there are perfectly definite diseases of overnourishment, high blood pressure, which culminates in apoplexy, kidney troubles, which result from the inability of these organs to eliminate all the waste matter that is delivered to them, fatty degeneration of the heart, or of the liver, or any of the vital organs. You may cause a headache by clogging the bloodstream through overeating, or you may cause it by eating small quantities of food if those foods are unbalanced and do not contain the mineral elements necessary to making of normal blood. Whatever the trouble with your health, it is my judgment that in two cases out of three, you will find it dates back to errors in diet. I do not think I exaggerate in saying that a knowledge of what to eat and how much to eat is two-thirds of the knowledge of how to keep yourself in permanent health. End of chapter 19. Chapter 20 of the Book of Life by Upton Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 20 Errors in Diet discusses the different kinds of foods and the part they play in the making of health and disease. It is my purpose in this chapter to lay down a few general principles to aid you in the practical problem of selecting the best diet for yourself. But it must be made clear at the outset that there can be no hard and fast rule. All human bodies are more or less alike, but on the other hand all are more or less different. Modern civilization has given very few bodies the chance to be perfect. Nearly all have some weakness, some abnormality, and need some special modification in diet to fit their particular problem. The ideal in each case would be a complete study of the individual system. Some day, no doubt, medical science will analyze the digestive juices and the gland secretions of the bloodstream of every human being and say, you need a certain percentage of starch and a certain percentage of protein. You need such and such proportion of phosphorus and iron. You should avoid certain acids, and so on. But at present, we are devoting our science to the task of killing and maiming other people, instead of enabling ourselves to live in health and happiness. So it is that most of those who read this book will be too poor to command the advice of a diet specialist. The best you can do is to get a few general ideas and try them out, watching your own body and learning its peculiarities. Human food contains three elements, proteins, fats, and carbohydrates. The proteins are the bodybuilding material, and the foods which are rich in proteins are lean meat, the white of eggs, milk and cheese, nuts, peas, and beans. A certain amount of this kind of food is needed by the body. If it is missing, the body will gradually waste away. If too much of it is taken, the body can turn it into energy-making material, but this is a wasteful process, and the best evidence appears to be that it is a strain upon the system. Experiments conducted by Professor Chittenden of Yale have proven conclusively that men can live and maintain body weight upon much less protein food than previously dietetic standards have indicated. The fats are found in fat meats and dairy products, and in nuts, olives, and vegetable oils. The body is prepared to digest and assimilate a certain amount of fat. No one knows how much. I have found in my own case that I require a great deal less than people ordinarily eat. I have for many years maintained good health upon a diet containing no more fat than one gets with lean meat once or twice a day. 
I never use butter or olive oil, nor any fat in cooking. My reason for this is that fats are the most highly concentrated form of food, and the easiest upon which to overeat. Excess of fat is a cause, not merely of obesity, but also of boils and pimples and pasty complexion, and other signs of a clogged bloodstream. The third variety of food is the carbohydrates, and of these there are two kinds, starches and sugars. Starch is the white material of the grains and tubers, the principal food element of bread and cereals, rice, potatoes, bananas, and many prepared substances such as cornstarch, tapioca, farina, and macaroni. Starchy foods compose probably half the diet of the average human being. In my own case, they compose about one-sixth. So you see to what extent my beliefs differ from the common. Starch is not really necessary in the diet at all. I have a friend who is subject to headaches and finds relief from them by a diet of meat, salads, and fresh fruits exclusively. The first thing that excess of starch or sugar does is to ferment in the system and cause flatulence and gas. But strange as it may seem, if the excess of starch is perfectly digested and assimilated into the system, the condition may be worse yet, because you may have a great quantity of energy-producing material without the necessary mineral elements which the body requires in the handling of it. If you cremate a human body and study the ashes chemically, you find a score or more of mineral salts. You find these in the blood, and no blood is normal and no body can be kept normal which does not contain the right percentage of these elements. It is not merely that they are needed to build bones and teeth. They are needed at every instant for the chemistry of the cells. Every time you move a muscle, you fill the cells of that muscle with a certain amount of waste matter. You may prove how deadly this matter is by binding a tight cord about your arm and then trying to use the arm. We are only at the beginning of understanding the subtle chemistry of the body, but this much we know. The cells transform the waste products, and they are thrown out of the system as ammonia, uric acid, etc., and for this process the blood must have a continuous supply of many mineral salts. So vital are they, and so fatal to health is their absence, that it is far better for you to eat nothing at all than to eat improperly balanced foods, or foods which are deficient in the organic salts. You may prove this to yourself by simple experiment. Put two chickens in separate pens, where nobody can feed them but yourself. Feed one of them on water and white bread, or cornstarch, or sugar, or any energy-making substance which contains little of the mineral elements. Feed the other chicken on plain water. You will find that the one which has the food will quickly become droopy and sickly, its feathers will fall out, it will have what in human beings would be known as headaches, colds, sore throats, decaying teeth, and boils. At the end of a couple of weeks, it will be a dead chicken. The one which you feed on water alone will not be a happy chicken, neither will it be a fat chicken, but it will be a live chicken, and a chicken without disease. I am going later on to discuss the subject of fasting. For the present, I will merely say that a chicken which has nothing but water is living upon its own flesh, and therefore has a meat diet, containing the mineral elements necessary to the elimination of the fatigue poisons. I am going to try not to be dogmatic in this book, and not to say things that I do not know. I confess to innumerable uncertainties about the subject of diet. But one thing I think I do know, and that is that human beings should eliminate absolutely from their food those modern artificial products which look so nice, and are so easy to handle, and are put up in packages with pretty labels, 
and have been in some way artificially treated to remove the wastes and impurities, including the vital mineral salts. Among such food substances I include lard, and its imitations made from cottonseed oil, white flour, all the prepared and refined cereals, polished rice, tapioca, farina, cornstarch, and granulated and powdered sugar. Any of these substances will kill a chicken in a couple of weeks, and the only reason they take a longer time to kill you is because you mix them with other kinds of foods. But to the extent that you eat them, your diet is deficient and do not console yourself with the idea that the mineral elements will be made up from the other foods. Because you don't know that, and nobody else knows it. Nobody knows just how much of any particular organic salt the body needs. All we know is that the primitive races which ate natural foods enjoyed vigorous health, while the American people who consume the greatest proportion of the so-called refined foods have the very best dentists and the very worst teeth in the world. There are many kinds of sugar, found in the sugar cane and the beet and in all fruits. Sugar may also be made from any form of starch. This is glucose, which is put up in cans and sold as an imitation of maple syrup. The ordinary granulated and powdered sugar is made by taking from the natural syrup every trace of mineral elements. So I have no hesitation in saying that the ordinary cane sugar and beet sugar of our breakfast tables and our confectionery stores is not a food, but a slow poison. The causes of the wonderful progress of American dentistry, which is the marvel of the civilized world, are cane sugar, white flour, and the frying pan, each of which dietetic crimes I shall take up in turn. We have the richest country in the world. We eat more food, probably by 50%, and we waste more food, probably by 500%, than any other people in the world. And yet, go to any small farming community in America, and what do you find? You find the teeth of the young children rotting in their heads, and having to be pulled out before their second teeth come. You find these second teeth rotting often before the age of twenty. A friend of mine who knows the American farmer sums it up this way. He has two things that he requires if he is to be really respectable and happy. First, he wants to get all the fireplaces in his home boarded up, and all the windows nailed tight. And second, he wants to get all his teeth out, and an artificial set installed. Out of the farmer's wives, in my neighborhood, not one in ten keeps her own teeth until she is thirty. If you go to the Balkans, where the peasants live on sour milk with grains which they grind at home, or to southern Italy and Sicily, where they live on cheese and black bread and olives, or among savage people, where they hunt and fish and gather the natural fruits, you find old men without a single decayed tooth. There must be some reason for this, and the reason is found in our denatured grocery store foods. The farmer's wife will gather up her eggs and her butter and cheeses and take them to the store and bring back cans of lard and packages of sugar. The farmer will sell his perfectly good wheat and cornmeal and bring back in his wagon cases of refined cereal foods, for which he has paid ten times the price of the grain. Dentists will tell you that the way candy injures the teeth is by sticking to them and fermenting, forming acids, which destroy the tooth structure. And that may be a part of the reason, but the principal reason why the teeth decay is because the bloodstream is abnormal, and is unable to keep up the repairs of the body. Your teeth are living structures, just as much as any other part of you, and they will resist decay if you supply them with the proper nourishment. You need sugar. You need a considerable quantity of it every day. 
nature provides this sugar in combination with the organic salts and also with the precious vitamins whose function in the body we are only beginning to investigate all the mineral substances which give the color and flavor to oranges apples peaches grapes figs prunes raisins all these you take out when you make sugar or perhaps you put in some imitations of them made from coal tar chemicals and drink them at your soda fountains so little appreciation has the american farmer's wife of natural fruits that when she preserves them she considers it necessary to fill them full of cane sugar in fact she has a notion that they won't keep unless she cooks them up with sugar so snobbish are we americans about our eating that we make the best of our foods into bywords we make jokes in our comic papers about the boarding-house prune and yet prunes and raisins are among the wholesomest foods we have and if we fed them to our children instead of cakes and candy and coal tar flavorings our dental industry would rapidly decline and the same thing is true of bread when i was a boy i thought i had to have hot bread at least twice a day and if i were called upon to eat bread that was more than a day old i felt that i was being badly abused by life i used to read fairy stories in which something called black bread was mentioned something obscure and terrible the symbol of human misery was cinderella sitting in the ashes and eating a crust of dry black bread but now since i have studied diet i have taken my place with cinderella i can afford to buy whatever kind of bread i want i can have the best white bread piping hot three times a day if i want it but what i eat three times a day is a crust of hard dry black bread black bread is the fairy tale name for bread made of the whole grain it is eaten that way by the peasant because he has no patent milling machinery at his disposal to fan away the life-giving elements of his food nearly all the mineral elements of the grain are contained in the outer dark colored portion the white part is almost pure starch and when you use white flour you are not merely starving your bloodstream your bones and your teeth you are also depriving the digestive tract of the rough material which it is accustomed to handle and which it needs to stimulate it to action i am aware that the whole grain products are a trifle less easy of digestion but we should not pamper and weaken our digestive tract any more than we let our muscles get flabby for lack of action we should require our stomachs to handle the ordinary natural foods precisely as we accustom our body to react from cold water and to stand honest hard work for ages japanese peasants have lived on rice with a little dried fish quite recently there began to spread throughout japan a mysterious disease known as beriberi it was especially prevalent in the army and so the scientists of japan set out to discover the cause and it proved to be the modern practice of polishing rice which takes off the outer coating of the grain rice is one of the most wholesome of foods if it is eaten in the natural state but in order to get it in that state in this country you have to find a special food store of the health cranks and have to pay a special price for it you have to pay a higher price for the whole wheat bread because ninety-nine people out of a hundred are ignorant and insist upon having their foodstuffs pretty to look at probably you have read sea stories and know the horrors of scurvy scurvy and berry berry are similar diseases with a similar cause the men on the old sailing ships used to have to live on white biscuit and salt meat and they always knew that to recover from their gnawing illness they must get to port and get fresh vegetables and fruits especially onions and lemons which contain the vitamins as well as the salts but you will see the modern housewife going into the grocery store and surveying the shelves of packaged goods 
and in her ignorance picking out the scurvy-making products and frequently paying for them a much higher price than for the health-making ones. Then, when she has got her white flour and her cane sugar and her lard, she will take it home and mix it up and put it in the frying pan and serve it hot to her husband and children. Nature has so constituted her husband and children that they digest starch before they digest fat. That is to say, the starch is digested mainly in the stomach, while the fat is digested mainly after the food has been passed on into the small intestine. But by frying the starch before it is eaten, the housewife carefully takes each grain of starch and protects it with a little covering of fat. Thus the digestive juices of the stomach cannot get at the starch, and the starch goes down into the small intestine, a good part undigested. If some evil spirit, wishing to make trouble for the human organism, had charge of the laying out of our diet, he could hardly devise anything worse than that. And yet, it would be no exaggeration to say that the average American, especially the average farmer, eats out of a frying pan. If his potatoes have to be warmed over, they go into the frying pan. His precious batter cakes and doughnuts are cooked in the frying pan, and all his precious hot breads are mixed with lard. If it were not for the fact that you cannot broil a beefsteak over a modern gas range, I would tell you that the first step toward health for the average American would be to throw the frying pan out of the window and to throw the cookbook after it. The whole modern art of cooking is largely a perversion, a product of idleness, vanity, and sensuality. It is one of the monstrous growths consequent upon our system of class exploitation. We have a number of idle people with nothing to do but eat, and who demonstrate their superiority to the rest of us by their knowledge of superior foods and superior ways of preparing them. They have the wealth of the world at their disposal, also the services of their fellow man without limit, and they set their fellow man to work to enable them to give elaborate banquets and to sit in solemn state and gorge themselves, and to have a full account of their behavior published in the next morning's newspapers. A great part of this perverse art we owe to what is called the ancient regime. In France, a regime which starved the French peasantry until they were black-skinned beasts hiding in caves and hollowed trees. So it comes about that our modern food depravity parades itself in French names, and American snobbery requires of its devotees a course in the French language sufficient to read a menu card. Needless to say, this elaborate gastronomic art has been developed without any relation to health or any thought of the true needs of the body. It is one of the products of the predatory system which we can say is absolute waste. Having done my own cooking for the past 25 years, I make bold to say that I can teach anybody all he needs to know about cooking in one lesson of half an hour, and that the total amount of cooking required for a large family can be done by one person in 20 minutes a day. In the first place, a great many foods do not have to be cooked at all and are made less fit by cooking. In the next place, the only cooking that is ever required is a little boiling, or in the case of meat, roasting or broiling. In the next place, the art of combining foods in cooking is a waste art, because no foods should be combined in cooking. Every food has its own natural flavor, which is lost in combination. And if anybody is unable to enjoy the natural flavors of simply cooked foods, there is one thing to say to that person, and that is to wait until he is hungry. Let him take a ten-mile walk in the open air, and he will have more interest in his next meal. 
i am not a fanatic and have no desire to destroy the pleasures of life i am recommending to people that they should seek the higher pleasures of the intellect and those pleasures are not found in standing over a cook stove nor in compelling others to stand over a cook stove moreover i know that the artificial mixing of foods to tempt people's palates is one of the principal causes of overeating and therefore of ill health and therefore of the ultimate destruction of the pleasure of life i went out from the world of cooks before i was twenty i wanted to write a book and to be let alone while i was doing it i lived by myself and found out about cooking by practical experience on a few occasions since then i have lived in a house with a servant and had some cooking done for me but it was always because somebody else wanted it and against my protest in the last ten years we have had no servant in our home and because i want my wife to give her energy to more important things than feeding me i do my share of getting every meal we have worked out a system of housekeeping by which we get a meal in five minutes and when we finish it it takes three minutes to clear things away if i tell you what i eat please do not get the impression that i am advising you to eat these same things my diet consists of the foods which i have found by long experience agree with me there are many other foods which are just as wholesome but which i do not eat either because they don't happen to agree with me or because i don't care for them so much i am fond of fruit and eat more of that than anything else it is not a cheap article of diet but you can save a good deal if you buy it in quantities as i do a little later i am going to discuss the prices of foods for breakfast i eat a slice of whole wheat bread three good-sized apples stewed and eight or ten dates it takes practically no time to prepare this breakfast the bread has to be baked of course but this is done wholesale we buy four loaves at a time and it is just as good at the end of a couple of weeks as when we buy it when i lived in the world of cooks i would call for applesauce which meant that somebody had to pare apples cut them up stew them mix them with sugar grate a little nutmeg over them set them on ice and serve them to me on a glass dish with a little pitcher of cream but now what happens is that i put a dozen apples in a big saucepan and let them simmer while i'm eating we have a rule in our family that we do not do any cooking except while we are eating because if we try it at any other time of the day we get buried in a book or in a manuscript and forget about it until the smoke causes somebody in the street to summon the fire department so the apples for my breakfast were cooked during last night's supper and during the breakfast there will be some vegetable cooking for lunch at this lunch which is my square meal i eat a large slice of beefsteak say a third of a pound jack london used to say that the only man who could cook a beefsteak was the fireman of a railway locomotive because he had a hot clean shovel the best imitation you can get is a hot clean frying pan and when you are sure that it is hot let it get hotter the whole secret of cooking meat is to keep the juices inside and to do that you must cook it quickly when you slap it down on a hot frying pan the meat is seared and the juices stay inside and if you do not turn it over until it is almost ready to burn you don't need to cook it very long on the other side that is the one secret of cooking worth knowing it doesn't cost anything and saves time instead of wasting it as i have never found anybody else capable of learning it i reserve the cooking of the beefsteaks as one of my family duties to continue the lunch a slice of whole wheat bread and a large quantity of some fresh salad such as celery or lettuce and tomatoes without dressing for part of this may be substituted a vegetable one or two beets or turnips 
cooked during a previous meal and warmed up in a couple of minutes and we do not throw away the tops of the turnips and beets and celery we put them on and cook them and they serve for the next day's meal if you would eat a large quantity of such greens once a day you would escape many of the ills that your flesh is at present heir to finally for dessert an orange and a small handful of raisins or one or two figs the evening meal will be the same as breakfast except once in a while when i am especially hungry and want some meat i am writing this in the winter season so the fruits suggested are those available in the winter the menu will be varied with every kind of fruit at the season when it is cheapest and most easily obtained the beefsteak will appear at about three meals out of four occasionally it will be replaced by the lean meat of pork or mutton or by fish the bread may be replaced by rice or boiled potatoes either white or sweet and occasionally by graham crackers i know that these contain a little fat and sugar but i try not to be fanatical about my diet and the rules i suggest do not carry the death penalty there was a time when i used to allow my friends to make themselves miserable by trying to provide me with special foods when they invited me to a meal but now i tell them to forget it and i politely nibble a little of everything and eat most of what i find wholesome if there is nothing wholesome i content myself with a pretense of a meal if i find myself in a restaurant i quite shamelessly get a piece of apple or pumpkin pie omitting most of the crust as i don't go away from home more than once or twice a month i do not have to worry about such indulgence the main thing is to arrange one's home diet on sound lines and to learn to enjoy the simple and wholesome foods of which there is a great variety obtainable and at prices possible to all but the wretchedly poor in conclusion since everybody likes to have a feast now and then i specify that my diet regimen allows for holidays assuming that i am your guest for a day and that you wish to blow me regardless of expense here will be the menu breakfast some graham crackers a bunch of raisins a can of sliced pineapple in the winter or a big chunk of watermelon in the summer dinner or lunch roast pork a baked apple a baked sweet potato and some spinach supper lettuce dates and a dish of popcorn flavored with peanut butter try this next christmas p s after this book had been put into type i chanced to be looking over herbert quick's illuminating book on board the good ship earth discussing the importance of certain organic salts to the body dr quick states animals have been fed as an experiment on foods deficient in phosphorus for a while they seemed to do well and then they collapsed it takes only three months of a ration without phosphorus to wreck an animal individual creatures were killed after a month of this diet and it was found that the flesh was taking the phosphate for the phosphorus exists in the body in that form from the bones to supply its need in other words the body was eating its own bones when this process had robbed the bones to the limit the collapse came and the animal could never recover end of chapter twenty chapter twenty one of the book of life by upton sinclair this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty one diet standards discusses various foods and their food values the quantities we need and their money cost i think there is no more important single question about health than the question of how much food we should eat it is one about which there is a great deal of controversy even among the best authorities we shall try here for a common-sense solution at the outset 
we have to remind ourselves of the distinction we tried to draw between nature and man. To what extent can civilized man rely upon his instincts to keep him in perfect health? Let us begin by considering the animals. How is their diet problem solved? Horses and cattle in a wild state are adjusted to certain foods which they find in nature, and so long as they can find it, they have no diet problem. Man comes and takes these animals and domesticates them. He observes their habits and gives them a diet closely approaching the natural one, and they get along fairly well. But suppose the man, with his superior skill in agriculture, taking wild grain and planting it, reaping and threshing it by machinery, puts before his horse an unlimited quantity of concentrated food, such as oats, which the horse can never get in a natural state. Will that horse's instincts guide it? Not at all. Any horse will kill itself by overeating on grain. I have read somewhere a clever saying that a farm is a good place for an author to live, provided he can be persuaded not to farm it. But once upon a time I had not heard that wise remark, and I owned and tried to run a farm. I had two beautiful cows, of which I was very proud, and one morning I woke up and discovered that the cows had got into the pear orchard and had been feeding on pears all night. In a few hours they both lay with bloated stomachs, dying. A farmer told me afterwards that I might have saved their lives if I had stuck a knife into their stomachs to let out the gas. I do not know whether this is true or not, but my two dead cows afforded a perfect illustration of the reason why civilized man cannot rely upon his instincts and his appetites to tell him when he has had enough to eat. He can only do this provided he rigidly restricts himself to the foods which he ate in the days when his teeth and stomach and bowels were being shaped by the process of natural selection. If he is going to eat any other than such strictly natural foods, he will need to apply his reason to his diet schedule. In a state of nature, man has to hunt his food and the amount that he finds is generally limited and requires a lot of exercise to get. Explorers in Africa give us a picture of man's life in the savage state, guided by his instincts and very little interfered with by reason. The savages will starve for long periods, then they will succeed in killing a hippopotamus or a buffalo, and they will gorge themselves, and nearly all of them will be ill, and several of them will die. So you see, even in a state of nature, and with natural foods, restraint is needed, and reason and moral sense have a part to play. What do reason and moral sense have to tell us about diet? Our bodily processes go on continuously, and we need at regular intervals a certain quantity of a number of different foods. The most elementary experiment will convince us that we can get along, maintain our body weight and our working efficiency upon a much smaller quantity of food than we naturally crave. Civilized custom puts before us a great variety of delicate and appetizing foods upon which we are disposed to overeat, and we are slow observers indeed if we do not note the connection between this overeating and ill health. So we are forced to the conclusion that if we wish to stay well, we need to establish a censorship over our habits. We need a different diet regimen from the haphazard one which has been established for us by a combination of our instincts with the perversions of civilization. Up to a few years ago, it was commonly taken for granted by authorities on diet that what the average man actually eats must be the normal thing for him to eat. Governments which were employing men in armies and at road building, and had to feed them and keep them in health, made large-scale observations as to what men ate, 
and thus were established by the old-fashioned diet standards. They are expressed in calories, which is a heat unit representing the quantity of fuel required to heat a certain small quantity of water a certain number of degrees. In order that you may know what I am talking about, I will give a rough idea of the quantity of the more common foods which it takes to make 100 calories. One medium-sized slice of bread, a piece of lean cooked steak the size of two fingers, one large apple, three medium tablespoons of cooked rice or potatoes, one large banana, a tablespoon of raisins, five dates, one large fig, a teaspoonful of sugar, a ball of butter about the size of your thumbnail, a very large head of lettuce, three medium-sized tomatoes, two-thirds of a glass of milk, a tablespoon of oil. You observe, if you compare these various items, how little guidance concerning food is given by its bulk. You may eat a whole head of lettuce weighing nearly a pound, and get no more food value than from a half ounce of olive oil which you pour over it. You may eat enough lean beefsteak to cover your plate, and you will not have eaten so much as a generous helping of butter. A big bowl of strawberries will not count half so much as the cream and sugar you put over them. So you may realize that when you eat olive oil, butter, cream, and sugar, you are in the same danger as the horse eating oats, or as my two cows in the pear orchard. And if some day a surgeon has to come and stick a knife into you, it may be for the same reason. The old-fashioned diet standards are as follows. Swedish laborers at hard work over 4,700 calories. Russian workmen at moderate work German soldiers in active service, Italian laborers at moderate work, between 3,500 and 3,700 calories. English weavers, nearly 3,500 calories. Austrian farm laborers, over 5,000 calories. Some 20 years ago, the United States government made observations of over 15,000 persons and established the following, known as the Atwater Standards. Men at very hard muscular work, 5,500 calories. Men at moderately active muscular work, 3,400 calories. Men at light to moderate muscular work, 3,050 calories. Men at sedentary, or women at moderately active work, 2,700 calories. In the last 10 or 15 years, there has arisen a new school of dietetic experts headed by Professors Chittenden and Fisher of Yale University. Professor Chittenden has published an elaborate book, The Nutrition of Man, in which he tells of long-continued experiment upon a squad of soldiers and a group of athletes at Yale University, also upon average students and professors. He has proved conclusively that all these various groups have been able to maintain full body weight and full working efficiency upon less than half the quantity of protein food hitherto specified, and upon anywhere from one-half to two-thirds the calorie value set forth in former standards. When I first read this book, I set to work to try its theories upon myself. During the five or six months that I lived on raw food, I took the trouble to weigh everything that I ate, and to keep a record. It is, of course, very easy to weigh raw foods exactly, and I found that I lived an active life and kept physical health upon slightly less than 2,500 calories a day. I have set this as my standard, and have accustomed myself to follow it instinctively and without wasting any thought upon it. Sometimes I fall from grace, for I still crave the delightful cakes and candies and ice cream upon which I was brought up. I always pay the penalty, and know that I will not get back to my former state of health until I skip a meal or two, and give my system a chance to clean house. 
the average man will find the regimen set forth in this book austere and awe-inspiring i do not wish to pose as a paragon of virtue so perhaps i should quote a sarcastic girl cousin who remarked that when i was a boy that the way to my heart was with a bag of ginger snaps i live in the presence of candy stores and never think of their existence but if someone brings candy into the house and puts it in front of me i have to waste a lot of moral energy in letting it alone a few years ago i had a young man as a secretary who discovered this failing of mine and used to afford himself immense glee by buying a box of chocolates and leaving it on top of my desk i would give him back the box with some of the chocolates missing but he would persist in forgetting it on my desk he would hide and laugh hilariously behind the door until my wife discovered his nefarious doings and warned me of them professor chittenden states quite simply the common-sense procedure in the matter of food quantity find out by practical experiment what is the very least food upon which you can do your work without losing weight that is the correct quantity for you and if you are eating more you certainly cannot be doing your body any good and all the evidence indicates that you are doing it harm you need not have the least fear in making this experiment that you will starve yourself later on in a chapter on fasting i shall prove to you that you carry around with you in your body sufficient reserve of food to keep you alive for eighty or ninety days and if you draw in a small quantity of this you do not do yourself the slightest harm cut down the amount of your food eat the bulky foods which contain less calorie value and weigh yourself every day and you will be surprised to discover how much less you need to eat than you have been accustomed to one of the things you will find out is that your stomach is easily fooled it is largely guided by bulk if you eat a meal consisting of a moderate quantity of lean meat a very little bread a heaping dish of turnip greens and a big slice of watermelon you will feel fully satisfied yet you will not have taken in one-third the calorie value that you would at an ordinary meal with gravies and dressings and dessert the bulky kind of food is that for which your system was adapted in the days when it was shaped by nature you have a large stomach many times as large as you would have had if you had lived on refined and concentrated foods such as butter sugar olive oil cheese and eggs you have a long intestinal tract adapted to slowly digesting foods and to the work of extracting nutrition from a mass of roughage you have a very large lower bowel which metchnikoff the russian scientist one of the greatest minds who ever examined the problems of health declares a survival a relic of a previous stage of evolution and a source of much disease the best thing you can do with that lower bowel is to give it lots of hay as it requires in other words to eat the salads and greens which contain cellulose material this contains no food value and does not ferment but fills the lower bowel and stimulates it to activity if you eat too much food three things may happen first it may not be digested and in that case it will fill your system with poisons second it may be assimilated but not burned up by the body in that case it has to be thrown out by the kidneys or the sweat glands and this puts upon these organs an extra strain to which in the long run they may be unequal or third the surplus material may be stored up as fat this is an old-time trick which nature invented to tide you over the times when food was scarce if you were a bear you would naturally want to eat all you could and be as fat as possible in november so that you might be able to hunt your prey when you came out from your winter sleep in april but you are not a bear and you expect to eat your regular meals all winter you have established a system of civilization which makes you certain of your food and the place where you keep your surplus is in the bank 
or sewed up in the mattress, or hidden in your stocking. In other words, a civilized man saves money, and the habit of storing globules of grease in the cells of his body is a survival of an old instinct and a needless strain upon his health. Not merely does the fat man have to carry all the extra weight around with him, but his body has to keep it and tend it. And what are the effects of this is fully shown by life insurance tables. People who are 5 or 10 percent overweight have 5 or 10 percent more chance of dying all the time, while people who are 5 or 10 percent underweight have 5 or 10 percent more than the average of life expectation. There is no answer to these figures, which are the result of the tabulation of many hundreds of thousands of cases. The meaning of them to the fat person is to put himself on a diet of lean meat, green vegetables, and fresh fruits, until he has brought himself down, not merely to the normal fatness of the civilized man, but to the normal leanness of the athlete, the soldier and campaign, the student who has more important things to think about than stuffing his stomach. There is, of course, a certain kind of leanness which is the result of ill health. There are wasting diseases, tuberculosis, for example, and anemia. There are people who worry themselves thin, and there are a few rare spiritual people, so-called, who fade away from lack of sufficient interest in their bodies. That is not the kind of leanness I mean, but the act of wiry leanness, which sometimes lives a hundred years. Nearly always you will find that such people are spare eaters, and you will find that our ideal of rosy plumpness, both for adults and children, is a wholly false notion. We once had in our home as servant an Irish girl, who was what is popularly called a picture of health with those beautiful flaming cheeks that Irish and English women so often have. She was in her early twenties, and nobody who knew her had any idea but that her health was perfect. But one morning she was discovered in bed with one side paralyzed, and in a couple of weeks she was dead with erysipelas. The color in her cheeks had been nothing but diseased blood vessels, overloaded with food material and with the blood in that condition one of those tiny vessels in the brain had become clogged. In the same way I have seen children, two or three years old, plump and rosy, and considered to be everything that children should be. But pneumonia would hit them, and in two or three days they would be at death's door. I do not mean that children should be kept hungry. On the contrary, they should have four or five meals a day, so that they do not have a chance to become too hungry. But at those meals they should eat in great part bulky foods which contain the natural salts needed for building the body. If a child asks for food, you may give it an apple, or you may give it a slice of bread and butter with sugar on it. The child will be equally well content in either case, but it is for you, with your knowledge of food values, to realize that the bread with butter and sugar contains two or three times as much nutriment as the apple, but contains practically none of the precious organic salts which will make the child's bones and teeth. So far, I have discussed the subject as if all foods grew on bushes outside your kitchen door, and all you had to do was go out and pick off what you wanted. But, as a matter of fact, foods cost money, and under our present system of wage slavery, the amount of money the average person can spend for food is strictly limited. In a later book, I am going to discuss the problem of poverty, its causes and remedies. All that I can do here is to tell you what foods you ought to have and if society does not pay you enough for your work to enable you to buy such foods, you may know that society is starving you, and you may get busy to demand your rights as human beings. Meantime, however, such money as you do have, you want to spend wisely, and the vast majority of you spend it very unwisely indeed. In the first place, 
a great many of the simplest and most wholesome foods are cheap, often because people do not know enough to value them. We insist upon having the choice cuts of meat because they are more tender to the teeth, but the cheaper cuts are exactly as nutritious. We insist upon having our meats loaded with fat, although fatness is an abnormal condition in an animal, and excess of fat is a grave error in diet. I live in a country where jackrabbits are a pest, and in the market they sell for perhaps one-fourth the cost of beef. And yet, I can hardly ever get them because people value them so little as food. They prefer the meat of a hog, which has been wallowing in a filthy pen and has been deliberately made so fat that it can hardly walk. I have already spoken of prunes, a much despised and invaluable food. All the dried fruits are rich in food values, and if we could get them untreated by chemicals, they would be worth their cost. I was brought up to despise the cheaper vegetables, such as cabbage and turnips. I never tasted boiled cabbage until I was forty, and then to my great surprise I made the discovery that it is good. Raw cabbage is as valuable as any other salad. It is a trifle harder to digest for some people, but I do not believe in pampering the stomach. Both potatoes and rice are cheap and wholesome. If only we would get unpolished rice, and if we would leave the skins on the potatoes until after they are cooked. Nearly all the mineral salts of the potato are just under the outer skin, and are removed by the foolish habit of peeling them. The prices of food differ so widely at different seasons and in different parts of the world that there is not much profit in trying to figure how cheaply a person can live. I have found that I spend for the diet I have indicated here from sixty to eighty cents a day. I do not buy any fancy foods, but, on the other hand, I do not especially try to economize. I buy what I want of the simple everyday foods in their season. Most everyone will find that it is a good business proposition to buy the foods which he needs to keep in health. If the average working man would add up the money he spends, and not merely in the restaurants, but in the candy stores, the drug stores, the tobacco stores, and the offices of doctors and dentists, he would find, I think, that he could afford to buy himself the necessary quantity of wholesome natural foods. For a family of three, in the place where I live, enough of these foods can be purchased for a dollar a day and this is about one-fourth of what common labor is being paid, and one-eighth of what skilled labor is being paid. I will specify the foods. A pound and a half of shoulder steak, a loaf of whole wheat bread, or a box of shredded wheat biscuit, a head of cabbage, a pound of prunes, and four or five pounds of apples. There are many ways of saving in the purchase of food if you put your mind upon it. If you are buying prunes, you may pay as high as fifty cents or a dollar a pound for the big ones, and they are not a bit better than the tiny ones, which you can buy for as low as eight cents a pound in bulk. When bread is stale, the bakers sell it for half price, despite the fact that only then has it become fit to eat. If you buy canned peaches, you will pay a fancy price for them and they will be heavy with cane sugar. But if you inquire, you find what are known as pie peaches, put up in gallon tins without sugar and at about half the price. The butcher will sell you what he calls Hamburg steak at a very low price, and if you let him prepare it out of your sight, he will fill it with fat and gristle. But let him make some while you watch, and then you will have a very good food. One of my diet rules is that I do not trust the capitalist system to fix me up any kind of mixed or ground or prepared foods. I have not eaten sausage since I saw it made in Chicago. Also, there is something to know about the cooking of foods, since it is possible to take perfectly good foods and spoil them by bad cooking. 
once upon a time our family discovered a fireless cooker and thought that was a wonderful invention for an absent-minded author and a wife who is given to revising manuscripts but recent investigations which have been made into the nature of the vitamins food ferments which are only partly understood suggest a prolonged cooking of food may be a great mistake the starch has to be cooked in order to break the cell walls by the expansion of the material inside twenty minutes will be enough in the case of everything except beans which need to be cooked four or five hours meat should be eaten rare except in the case of pork which harbors a parasite dangerous to the human body therefore pork should always be thoroughly cooked the white of eggs is made less digestible by boiling hard or frying eggs should never be allowed to boil put them on in cold water and take them off as soon as the water begins to boil it is not necessary to cook either fresh fruit or dried the dried fruits may be soaked and eaten raw but i find that several fruits especially apples and pears do not agree with me well if they are eaten raw so i stew them for fifteen or twenty minutes i have no objection to canned fruits and vegetables provided one takes the trouble in opening them to make sure there is no sign of spoiling if you put up your own fruits do not put in any sugar all you have to do is let them boil for a few minutes and to seal them tightly while they are boiling hot the whole secret of preserving is to exclude the air with its bacteria if you live on a farm you will have no trouble in following the diet here outlined for you can produce for yourselves all the foods that i have recommended only do not make the mistake of shipping out your best foods and taking back the products of a factory just because you have read lying advertisements about them take your own wheat and oats and corn to the mill and have it ground whole and make your own breads and cereals try the experiment of mixing whole cornmeal with water and a little salt and baking it into hard crisp corn dodgers i do not eat these but only because i cannot buy them and have no time to make them another common article of food which i do not recommend is salted and smoked meats i do not pretend to know the effects of large quantities of salt and saltpeter and wood smoke upon the human system but i know that dr wiley's poison squad proved definitely that a number of these inorganic minerals are injurious to health and i prefer to take fresh meat when i can get it i use a moderate quantity of common salt on meat and potatoes because there seems to be a natural craving for this i know that many health enthusiasts insist that i am thus putting a strain on my kidneys but i will wait until these health enthusiasts make clear to me why deer and cattle and horses in a wild state will travel many miles to a salt lick i have learned that it is easy to make plausible statements about health but not so easy to prove them for example i was told that it is injurious to drink water at meals and for years i religiously avoided the habit but it occurred to some college professor to find out if this was really true and he carried on a series of experiments which prove that the stomach works better when its contents are diluted the only point about drinking at meals is that you should not use the liquid to wash down your food without chewing it i can suggest two other ways by which you may save money on food one is by not eating too much and another is by eating all that you buy the amount of food that is wasted by the people of america would feed the people of any european nation the amount of food that is thrown out from any of our big american leisure class hotels would feed the children of a european town i think it may fairly be described as a crime to throw into the garbage pail food which might nourish human life in our family we have no garbage pail what little waste there is we burn in the stove and my wife turns into roses it consists of the fat which we cannot help getting at the butchers and the bones of meat and the skins of some fruits and vegetables 
it would never enter into our minds to throw out a particle of bread or meat or other wholesome food if we have something that we fear may spoil we do not throw it out we put it into a saucepan and cook it for a few minutes if you will make the same rule in your home you will stop at least that much of the waste of american life and as to the big leisure class hotels and the banquet tables of the rich just wait a few years and i think the social revolution will attend to them End of chapter 21Chapter 22 of the Book of Life by Upton Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 22 Foods and Poisons concludes the subject of diet and discusses the effect upon the system of stimulants and narcotics. A few years ago there died an old gentleman who had devoted some twenty years of his life to teaching people to chew their food. Horace Fletcher was his name, and his ideas became a fad, and some people carried them to comical extremes. But Fletcher made a real discovery, what he called the food filter. This is the automatic action of the swallowing apparatus, whereby nature selects the food which has been sufficiently prepared for digestion. If you chew a mouthful of food without ever performing the act of swallowing, you will find that the food gradually disappears. What happens is that all of it, which has been reduced to a thin paste, will slip unnoticed down your throat, and you may go on putting more food into your mouth and chewing, and you can eat a whole meal without ever performing the act of swallowing. Fletcher claimed that this is the proper way to eat, and that you can train yourself to follow this method. I have tried his idea and adopted it. One of my diet rules, to which there is no exception, is that if I haven't the time to chew my food properly, I haven't the time to eat. I skip that meal. The habit of bolting food is a source of disease. To be sure, the carnivorous animals bolt their food, but they are tougher than we are, and do not carry the burden of a large brain and a complex nervous system. If you swallow your meals half-chewed and wash them down with liquids, you may get away with it for a while, but some day you will pay for it with dyspepsia and nervous troubles. And the same thing applies to your habit of jumping up from meals and rushing away to work, whether it be work of the muscles or of brain and nerves. Proper digestion requires the presence of a quantity of blood in the walls of the stomach and digestive tract. It requires the attention of your subconscious mind, and this means rest of your muscles and brain centers. If you cannot rest for an hour after meals, omit that meal, or make it a light one, of fruit juices, which are almost immediately absorbed by the stomach, and of salads which do not ferment you may rest assured that it will not hurt you to skip a meal, and make up for it when you have time to be quiet. I have been many times in my life under very intense and long-continued nervous strain. For example, during the Colorado coal strike, I led a public demonstration which kept me in a state of excitement all the day and a good part of the night several weeks. During this period I ate almost nothing, a baked apple and a cup of custard would be as near as I would go to a meal. And as a result, I came through the experience without any injury whatever to my health. I lost perhaps ten pounds in weight, but that was quickly made up when I settled back into a normal way of life. I have been on camping trips, when I had a great deal of hard work to do, carrying a canoe long distances on my back or paddling at forty miles a day. On the mornings of such a trip, I have seen a guide cook himself an elaborate breakfast of freshly baked bread, bacon, and even beans, and make a hearty meal, and then go straight to work. My meal, on the contrary, would consist of a small dish of stewed prunes, or perhaps some huckleberries or raspberries, 
if they could be found. I will not say that I could do as much as the guide, because he was used to it, and I was not. But I can say this, if I had eaten his breakfast at the start of the day, I would have been dead before night. And I mean the word dead, quite literally. I know a man who started to climb Whiteface Mountain in the Adirondacks. He climbed halfway, and then ate lunch, which consisted of nine hard-boiled eggs. Then he started to climb the rest of the mountain, and dropped dead of acute indigestion. There are few poisons which can affect the system more quickly or more dangerously than a mass of food which is not digested. The stomach is an ideal forcing house for the breeding of bacteria. It provides warmth and moisture, and you, in your meal, provide the bacteria and the material upon which they thrive. Under normal conditions, the stomach pours out a gastric juice which kills the bacteria. But let this gastric juice for any reason be lacking, because your nervous energy has gone somewhere else, or because your bloodstream from which the gastric juice must be made has been drawn away to the muscles by hard labor. Then you have a yeast pot, with great quantities of gases and poisons. In acute cases, the results are evident enough. Violent pains and convulsions, followed by coma, and the turning black of the body. But what you should understand is that you may produce a milder case of such poisoning, and may do it day after day habitually, and little by little your vital organs will be weakened by the strain. It does not make any difference at what hour of the twenty-four you take the great bulk of your food. It is one of the commonest delusions that you get some strengthening effect from your food immediately, and must have this strength in order to do hard work. To be sure, there are substances, such as grape sugar, which require practically no digesting. You can hold them in the mouth, and they will be digested by the saliva and absorbed at once into the bloodstream. But unless you have been starved for a long period, you do not need to get your strength in this rush fashion. If you ate your normal meals on the previous day, your bloodstream is fully supplied with nutriment which has been put through a long process of preparation, and you can get up in the morning and work all day, if necessary, upon what is already in your system. To be sure, you may feel hungry and even faint, but that is merely a matter of habit. Your system is accustomed to taking food and expects it. But if you are a laborer doing hard work, you can easily train yourself to eat a light meal in the morning and another light meal at noon, and to eat a hearty meal when your work is done and you can rest. Two light meals and a hearty meal are all that any person needs, and you can prove it to yourself by trying it and watching your weight once a week. I have tried many experiments, and the conclusion to which I have come is that there is no virtue in any particular meal hours or any particular number of meals. For several years I tried the experiment of two meals a day. I was living a retired life and had little contact with the world, and I would make it a hearty meal at ten o'clock in the morning, and another at five in the afternoon. But later on I found that inconvenient, and now I take a light breakfast, and two moderate-sized meals at the conventional hours of lunch and dinner. I can arrange my own time, so after meal times is when I get my reading done. Sometimes, when I am tired, I feel sleepy after meals, but I have learned not to yield to this impulse. I do not know how to explain this. I have observed that animals sleep after eating, and it appears to be a natural thing to do, but I know that if I go to sleep after a meal, Nature makes clear to me that I have made a mistake, and I do not repeat it. I never eat at night, and always go to bed on an empty stomach, so I am always hungry when I open my eyes in the morning. I never know what it is not to be hungry at meal times, and my habits are so regular that I could set my watch by my stomach. Another common habit, which is harmful, is eating between meals. 
I have known people who are accustomed to nibble at food nearly all the time. Shelley records that he tried it as an experiment, thinking it might be a convenient way to get digestion done. But he found that it did not work. The stomach is apparently meant to work in pulses, to do a job of digesting, and then to rest and accumulate the juices for another job. It will accustom itself to a certain regime, and will work accordingly. But if, when it has half digested a load of food, you pile more food in on top, you make as much trouble as you would make in your kitchen if you required your cook to prepare another meal before she has cleaned up after the last one. Three times a day is enough for any adult to eat. Children require to eat oftener, because their bodies are more active, and they not merely have to keep up weight, but to add to it. The simplest way to arrange matters with children is to give them three good meals at the hours when adults eat, and then to give them a couple of pieces of fruit between breakfast and lunch, and again between lunch and supper. I have never seen a child who would not be satisfied with this, when once the habit was established. I have already spoken of the cooking and serving of food. I consider that the gastronomic art, as it is pompously called, is 99% plain rubbish. To be sure, if foods are appetizingly prepared and look good and smell good and taste good, they will cause the gastric juices to flow abundantly, as the Russian scientist Pavlov has demonstrated by practical experiment with the stomach pump. But I know without any stomach pump that the best thing to make my gastric juices flow is hard work and a spare diet. When I come home from five sets of tennis and have a cold shower and a rub down, my gastric juices will flow for a piece of cold beefsteak and a cold sweet potato quite as well as for anything that is served by a leisure class chef. Needless to say, I want food to be fresh and I want it to be clean but I have other things to do with my time and money than to pamper my appetites and encourage food whims. If you have a grandmother, or ever had one, you know what grandmothers tell you about hot, nourishing food. But I have tried the experiment and satisfied myself that there is absolutely no difference in nourishing qualities between hot food and cold food. If you chew your food sufficiently, it will all be ninety-eight and six-tenths degree food when it gets to your stomach. And that is the way your stomach wants it. Of course, if you have been out in a blizzard and are chilled and want to restore the body temperature, a hot drink will be one of the quickest ways. And if the emergency is extreme, you may even add a stimulant. On the other hand, if you are suffering from heat, it is sensible to cool your body by a cold drink but you should use as much judgment with yourself as you do with a horse, which you would not permit to drink a lot of cold water when he is heated up and is going into his stall to stand still. I have mentioned the word stimulants, and this opens a large subject. There are drugs which affect the body in two different ways. Some excite the nerves, and through the nerves, the heart and bloodstream, to more intense activity. Others have the effect of deadening the nerves and dulling the sense of exhaustion and pain. One of these groups is called stimulants. The other is called narcotics. But as a matter of fact, the stimulants are really narcotics, because they operate by dulling the nerves whose function it is to prevent the overaccumulation of fatigue poisons. In other words, they keep the nerves and muscles from knowing that they are tired, so they go on working. It is possible, of course, to conceive of an emergency in which that is necessary. Once upon a time, on a hunting trip, I had been traveling all day and was caught in a rainstorm and exhausted and chilled to the bone. I had to make camp without a fire, so when I got the tent up, I wrapped myself in blankets and drank a couple of tablespoons full of whiskey. That is the only time I have ever taken whiskey in my life, and it warmed me almost instantly, and did me no harm. 
in the same way there were two or three occasions when i was on the verge of a nervous breakdown could not sleep and let the doctor give me a sleeping powder but in each case i knew that i was fooling with a dangerous habit and i did no more fooling than necessary no one should make use of either stimulants or narcotics except in extreme emergency and never but a few times in a lifetime what you should do is to change your habits so that you will not need to overstrain all these drugs are habit forming that is to say they leave the body no better and with a craving for repetition of the relief when you are tired it is because your muscles and nerves are storing up fatigue poisons more rapidly than your bloodstream can get rid of them you need to know about this condition and exhaustion and pain are nature's protective warning if you put a stop to the warning you are as unintelligent as the eastern despots who used to cut off the head of the messenger who brought bad tidings if when you have a headache you go to the drug store and let the druggist mix you one of those white fizzy drinks what you are doing is not to get rid of the poisons in your bloodstream but merely to reduce the action of your heart so as to keep the blood from pressing so fast into the aching blood vessels and nerves you may try that trick with your heart a number of times but sooner or later you'll try it once too often and your heart will stop a little bit quicker than you meant it to drugs are poisons and their action depends upon their poisoning some particular portion of the body and temporarily paralyzing it and bear this in mind they are nonetheless poisonous because they are natural products you can kill yourself by cyanide of potassium which comes out of a chemist's retort or you can kill yourself just as dead with laudanum which comes out of a plant or with the contents of the venom sac of a snake you are poisoning yourself nonetheless certainly if you use alcohol which is made from the juices of beautiful fruits and has had hosts of famous poets writing songs about it or you can poison yourself with the caffeine which you get in a lovely brown bean which comes from brazil fragrant to the nostrils and delicious to the taste you may drink wine and tea and coffee for a hundred years and have your picture published in the newspapers as a proof that these habits conduce to health but nothing will be said about the large number of people who practiced these habits and didn't live so long and about how long they might have lived if they hadn't practiced these habits i was brought up in the south and my elders belonged to a generation which had grown up in wartime for this reason many of the men both drank and smoked to excess and in my boyhood i lived among them and watched them and with the help of advice from a wise mother i conceived a horror of every kind of stimulant the alcoholic poets could not fool me i had been in the alcoholic wards of hospitals i had seen one man after another beautiful and kindly and gracious men dragged down into a pit of torment and shame alcohol is i think the greatest trap that nature ever set for the feet of the human race it is responsible for more degradation and misery than any other evil in the world and i say this knowing well that my socialist friends will cry what about capitalism my answer is that i doubt if there ever would have been any capitalism in the world if it had not been for alcohol if the workers had not been systematically poisoned and all their savings taken away from them by the gin mill they would never have submitted to the capitalist system they would have built the cooperative commonwealth at the time they were building the first factories i listen to the arguments of my radical friends about personal liberty but i note that in russia when it was a question of making a practical revolution and keeping it alive the first thing the leaders did was to drag out the contents of the wine cellars of the palaces 
and smashed them in the gutters. Tea and coffee are, of course, much milder in their effects than alcohol. You can play with them longer, and the punishment will be less severe. But if you make habitual use of them, you will pay the penalty which all drugs exact from the system. Your brain and your nerve centers will be less sensitive, less capable of working except under the influence of drugs. Their reacting power will be dulled, and they will wear out more quickly. I have watched the slaves of the morning cup of coffee, and know how they suffer when they do not get it. Likewise, I have watched the tea drinkers. It is comical to live in England, and see all the able-bodied men obliged to leave their work at four o'clock in the afternoon, and seek the regular stimulus for their tired nerves. If you are to meet anybody, it is always for tea that the ceremony is set, and if you refuse to drink tea, your hostess will be uncomfortable, unable to talk about anything but the strange, incredible notion that one can live without tea. I discovered after a while the solution of this problem. I would say that I preferred a little hot water, if you please, and so my hostess would pour me a cup of hot water, and I would sit and gravely sip it, and everybody would be perfectly content. I was conforming to the outward appearance of normality, which is what the British conventions require. I have never drunk a cup of coffee, so I do not know what its effect on me would be. But some fifteen years ago I drank a glass of very weak iced tea at eight o'clock in the evening, and did not get to sleep until four or five the next morning. So I know that there is really a drug in tea. I know also that I might accustom my system to it, just as I might learn to poison my lungs with nicotine without being made immediately and suddenly ill. But why should I wish to do this? Life is so interesting to me that I do not need to stimulate my brain centers in order to appreciate the thrill of it. And when I am tired, I can rest myself by listening to music or by reading a worthwhile novel, things which I have found do not leave the after-effects of nicotine. I remember the first time I met Jack London. Our meeting consisted in good part of his kidding me because I was lacking in the congenial vices of the café. He told me how much I had missed because I had never been drunk. One ought to try the great adventure at least once. Poor Jack is gone, because his kidneys gave out at forty, and nothing could seem more ungracious than to point out that I am still alive, and finding life enjoyable. Yet in this book we are trying to find out how to live, and if there are habits which wreck and destroy a magnificent physique, and bring a great genius to death at the age of forty? Surely the rest of us want to know about it, and to be warned in time. I mention Jack London in this connection, because he has said the last word on the subject of alcohol. Read John Barleycorn, and especially read between the lines of it, and you will not need my argument to persuade you to be glad that the Eighteenth Amendment has been written into the Constitution, and that is your duty as a socialist not merely to obey it, but to vote for its enforcement. I am proceeding on the assumption that your life is of importance to you, that you have a job to do which you know to be worthwhile, to which you desire to apply your powers. You agree with me that the workers of the world are suffering, and that it is necessary for them to find their freedom, and that this takes hard work and hard thinking. You may say that I exaggerate the amount of harm that is done to the system by tea and coffee, alcohol and tobacco. Well, let us assume that in moderate quantities they do no harm at all. Even so, I have the right to ask you to show that they do some good. Otherwise, surely, it is a mistake for the workers to spend their savings upon them. Consider, for example, the amount of money which the wage slaves of the world spend upon tobacco. 
suppose they could be persuaded for two or three years to spend this amount upon good reading matter do you not think there would be an improvement in their condition surely you cannot maintain that the use of tobacco is necessary to the activities of the brain surely you do not think that a man has to have a cigarette in order to stimulate his thoughts or to smoke a pipe to rest himself after his work is done i offer myself as evidence in such a controversy i have written as many books as any man in the radical movement and the sum total of my lifetime smoking amounts to one-half of one cigarette. I tried that when I was eight years old, and somebody told me a policeman would arrest me if he caught me, and I threw away the cigarette, and ran and hid in the alley, and have not yet got over my scare. In the Journal for Industrial Hygiene for October 1920 is an article entitled fatigue and efficiency of smokers in a strenuous mental occupation experiments were conducted among telegraph operators and the result showed that the heavy smokers of the group showed a higher output rate at the beginning of the day than the light smokers but their rate falls off more markedly in the late hours and their production for the whole day is definitely less than that of the light smokers the heavy smokers also show less ability than the light smokers to respond to increasing pressures of work in the late hours of the day by handling their full share of the work presented one point upon which every medical authority agrees is that the use of nicotine is of deadly effect upon the immature organism half-grown youths who smoke cigarettes will never be full-sized men they will never have normal lungs or a normal heart and likewise all authorities agree about the effect of smoking upon the organism of women i gave what little help i could to the task of helping to set women free and to make them the equals of men but i was always pained when i discovered that some of my feminist friends understood by women's emancipation no more than her right to adopt men's vices i would say to these ardent young female radicals who cultivate the art of dangling a cigarette from their lower lip and sip cocktails out of coffee cups in greenwich village cafes that they will never be able to bear sound children but i know that this would not interest them they don't want to bear any children at all so i say that they will never be able to think straight thoughts and will be nervous invalids when they are thirty we went to war to make the world safe for democracy and we put several millions of our young men into armies and if there were any of them who did not already know how to smoke cigarettes they learned it under official sanction so now we have a national tobacco bill that runs up to two billions and will ensure us a new generation of class c rating speaking to the young radicals who are reading my books i say we want to make the world over to make it a place of freedom and kindness instead of the hell of greed and hate that it is today for that purpose we need a new moral code and we can never win our victory without it i have attended radical conventions sitting in unventilated halls amid clouds of tobacco smoke and listening to men wrangle all through the day and a great part of the night i have watched the fatal dissensions in the movement the quarrelings of the right wingers and the left wingers and all stages and all degrees in between and i have wondered not jestingly but in pitying earnest how much of all those personalities and factional misunderstanding had their origin in carbon dioxide and nicotine there is no use suggesting such ideas to the older men whose habits are fixed but a new generation is coming on with a new vision of the enormous task before it and is it too much to expect of these young men and women that they shall realize in advance the grim tasks they have to do and shall learn to run the machine of their bodies so as to get out of it the maximum amount of service 
is it too much to hope for that some day we shall have a race of young fighters for truth and justice who are willing to live abstemious lives and consecrate themselves to the task of delivering mankind from wage slavery and war end of chapter 22 Chapters 25 and 26 of The Book of Life by Upton Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 25 The Fasting Cure deals with nature's own remedy for disease and how to make use of it. We have next to consider the various human ailments, what causes them, and how they can be remedied. As it happens, I know of a cure that comes pretty near being that impossible thing, a cure-all. At any rate, it is so far ahead of other cures that a discussion of it will cover three-fourths of the subject. When I was a boy living in New York, there was a man by the name of Dr. Tanner, who took a forty-day fast. He was on public exhibition at the time, and was supposed to be watched day and night. The newspapers gave a great deal of attention to the story, and crowds used to come to gaze at him. I remember very well the conversations I heard about the matter. People were quite sure that it couldn't be true. The man must be getting something to eat on the sly. He must have some nourishment in the water he drank. No human being could fast more than five or six days without starving to death. In the year 1910, I published in the United States and England a magazine article telling how, on several occasions, I had fasted ten or twelve days, and what I had accomplished by it. I found that I had the same difficulty to confront as old Dr. Tanner. I received scores of letters from people who called me a faker, and I read scores of newspaper editorials to the same effect. The New York Times published a dispatch about three young ladies on Long Island who were trying a three-day fast, and the Times commented editorially to the effect that these young ladies were the victims of a shallow and unscrupulous sensationalist. The notion that human beings can perish for lack of food in a few days is deeply rooted in people's minds. Recently, a group of eleven Irishmen in jail set to work to starve themselves to death, as a protest against British rule in their country. Day after day, the newspapers reported the news from Cork Prison, and at about the twentieth day, they began to state that the prisoners were dying, that the priest had been sent for, that their relatives were gathered on the prison steps. Day after day, such reports continued, through the thirties, and the forties, and the fifties, and the sixties, and the seventies, one man died on the 88th day, and McSwinney died on the 74th. The other nine gave up after 94 days, and were all restored to health. I watched carefully the newspaper and magazine comment on this incident, yet I did not see a single remark on the medical aspects of it. I could not discover that scientific men had learned anything whatever about the ability of the body to go without food for long periods. Get this clear at the outset. Nobody ever starved to death in less than two months. And it is possible for a fat person to go without food for as long as three or four months. People who starve to death in shorter times do not die of starvation, but of fright. The first time I fasted happened to be at the time of the Messina earthquake. I was walking about perfectly serene and happy, having been without food for three days, and I read in my newspaper how the rescue ships had reached Messina and found the population ravenous, in the agonies of starvation, some of the people having been without food for seventy-two hours. It sounds so much worse, you see, when you state it in hours. The second point to get clear is that the fast is a physiological process. That is to say, it is something which nature understands and carries through in her own serene and efficient way. When you take a fast, you are not carrying out a freak notion of your own or of mine. 
you are discovering a lost instinct. Every cat and dog knows enough not to take food when it is ill. It is only in hospitals conducted by modern medical science that the custom prevails of serving elaborate trays to invalids. I remember a story about a man who made himself a reputation and a fortune by curing the pet dogs of the rich. These beautiful little creatures which sleep between silken covers and have several servants to wait upon them, and are fed from gold and silver dishes upon rich and elaborately cooked foods, fall victim to as many diseases as their mistresses. And they would be brought to the specialist, who conducted his dog hospital in an old brickyard. In each one of the compartments of the brick kiln, he would shut up a dog with a supply of fresh water, a crust of stale bread, a piece of bacon rind, and the sole of an old shoe. And after a few days, he would go back and find that the dog had eaten the crust of bread, and then he would write to the owner that the dog was on the high road to recovery. He would go back a few days later and find that the dog had eaten the piece of bacon rind, and then he would write that the dog was very nearly cured. He would wait until the dog had eaten the piece of shoe leather, and then he would write that the dog was completely cured and the owner might come and take it away. Just what is the process of the fast cure? I do not pretend to know positively. I can only make guesses and wait for science to investigate. I believe that the main source of diseases of civilized man is improper nutrition and the clogging of the system with food poisons in various stages. And when you fast, you do two things. First, you stop entirely the fresh supply of those food poisons, and second, you allow the whole of the body's digestive and assimilative tract to rest, to go to sleep, as it were, so that all the body's energy may go to other organs. The body carries with it at all times a surplus store of nutriment, which can be taken up and used by the bloodstream, apparently with much less trouble than is required to convert fresh food to the body's uses. In other words, the body can feed on its own tissues more easily than it can feed from the stomach. In the fast, you may lose anywhere from half a pound to two pounds in weight per day, and this will be taken first from your store of fat, and then from your muscular tissues. Every part of your muscular tissue will be taken before anything is taken from your vital organs, your nerves, or your bloodstream. So long as there is a particle of muscular material left, so long as you can make even the slightest movement of one finger, you are still fasting. And it is only when your muscular tissue is all gone that you begin at last to starve. So far as I know, the cases of McSwinney and the other Irishmen are the only cases on record where fasters have died of starvation. What the body does during the fast is quite plain, and can be told by many symptoms. It begins a thorough house-cleaning, throwing out poisonous material by every channel. The perspiration and breath become offensive, the tongue becomes heavily coated, so that you can scrape the material off with a knife. I have heard vegetarians explain this by saying that when the body is living off its own tissues, it is following a cannibal diet. But that is all nonsense, because you can live on meat exclusively and quickly satisfy yourself that none of these symptoms occurs. It is evident that the body is taking advantage of the opportunity to get rid of waste products. And this will go on for 10 days, for 20 days, in some cases for as long as 40 or 50 days. And then suddenly occurs a strange thing. In spite of the cannibal diet, the symptoms all come to a sudden end. The tongue clears, the breath becomes sweet, the appetite suddenly awakens. During the period of a normal fast, you lose all interest in food. You almost forget that there is such a thing as eating. You can look at food without any more desire for it than you have to swallow marbles and carpet tacks. But then suddenly appetite returns, as I have explained, and you find that you can think of nothing but food. 
This is what students of the subject describe as a complete fast. And while I do not want to go to extremes and say that the complete fast will cure every case of every disease, I can certainly say this. In the letters which have come to me from people who tried the fast at my suggestion, there are cases of every kind of common disease. In my book, The Fasting Cure, I give the results of cases reported to me after the publication of my first magazine article. I quote two paragraphs. The total number of fasts taken was 277, and the average number of days was six. There were 90 of five days or over, 51 of 10 days or over, and six of 30 days or over. Out of the 119 person who wrote to me, 100 reported benefit, and 17 no benefit. Of these 17, about half give wrong breaking of the fast as the reason for the failure. In cases where the cure had not proved permanent, about half mentioned that the recurrence of the trouble was caused by wrong eating. About half of the rest made this quite evident by what they said. Also, it is to be noted that in the cases of the seventeen who got no benefit, nearly all were fasts of only three or four days. Following is the complete list of diseases benefited. Forty-five of the cases have been diagnosed by physicians. Indigestion, usually associated with nervousness, 27. Rheumatism, 5. Colds, 8. Tuberculosis, 4. Constipation, 14. Poor circulation, 3. Headaches, 5. Anemia, 3. Scrofula, 1. Bronchial trouble, 5. Syphilis, 1. Liver trouble, 5. General debility, 5. Chills and fever, 1. Blood poisoning, 1. Ulcerated leg, 1. Neurasthenia, 6. Locomotor ataxia, 1. Sciatica, 1. Asthma, 2. Excess of uric acid, 1. Epilepsy, 1. Pleurisy, 1. Impaction of bowels, 1. Eczema, 2. Catarrh, 6. Appendicitis, 3. Valvular disease of heart, 1. Insomnia, 1. Gas poisoning, 1. Grip, 1. Cancer, 1. There are many diseases with many causes, and some yield more quickly than others to the fast. In the first group, I put the diseases of the digestive and alimentary tract. Stomach and bowel troubles, and the nervous disorders occasioned by these, stop almost immediately when you fast. Next come disorders of the bloodstream, which are generally a second stage of digestive troubles. Everything immediately due to the impurities of the blood, pimples, boils, and ulcers, inflammation, badly healing wounds, etc., respond to a few days of fasting as to the magic touch of the old-time legends. When it comes to diseases caused by germ infections, you have a double aspect of the problem and must have a double method of attack. I would not like to say that fasting could cure such a disease as sleeping sickness, to the germs of which our systems are not accustomed, and against which they may well be helpless. On the other hand, in the case of common infections, such as colds and sore throats, the fast is again the touch of magic. Having been plagued a great deal by these ailments and pastimes, I am accustomed to say that I would not trade my knowledge of fasting for everything else that I know about health. The first thing you must do if you want to take a fast is to read the literature on the subject and make up your mind that the experiment will do you no injury. You should also try to get your relatives to make up their minds. Because you are nervous when you are fasting and cannot withstand the attacks of the people around you, who will go into a panic and throw you into a panic. As I said before, it is quite possible for people to die of panic but I do not believe that anybody ever died of a fast. I have known of two or three cases of people dying while they were fasting, but I feel quite certain that the fast did not cause their death. They would have died anyhow. You must bear in mind that among the people who try the fast, a great many are in a desperate condition, 
some have been given up by the doctors and if now and then one of these should die we may surely say that they died in spite of the fast and not because of it there is no physician who can save every patient and it would be absurd to expect this i have read scores of letters from people who were at the point of death from such fatal diseases as bright's disease sclerosis of the liver and fatty degeneration of the heart and were literally snatched out of the jaws of death by beginning a fast i would not like to guess just what percentage of dying people in our hospitals might be saved if the doctors would withdraw all food from them but i await with interest the time when medical science will have the intelligence to try that simple experiment and report the results just the other day in the los angeles county jail a chiropractor went on hunger strike as a protest against imprisonment and he fasted forty-one days then he broke his fast the reason being given that his pulse was down to fifty-four and he was afraid of dying i smiled to myself the normal pulse is seventy i have taken my pulse many times at the end of a ten-day fast and it has been as low as thirty-two and i am not dead yet and if i wait to die from the symptoms of a fast i expect to live a long time indeed the first time i fasted i felt very weak and lay around and hardly cared to lift my head if i walked from my bed to the lawn i was tired in the legs but since then i have grown used to fasting i have fasted for a week probably twenty or thirty times and on such occasions i have gone about my business as if nothing were happening of course i would not try to play tennis or to climb a mountain but it is a fact that on the seventh day of a fast in new york i climbed the five or six flights of stairs to the top of the metropolitan opera house and felt no ill effects from doing this i climbed slowly and was careful not to tire myself the simple rule is not to have anything that you must do on the fast and then do what you feel like doing lie down and rest and read a book and take as much exercise as you find you enjoy keep your mind quiet and free from worries and lock out of the house everybody who tells you that your heart is going to stop beating in the next few minutes and that you must have an injection of strychnine to start it and some beefsteak and fried onions to restore your strength give yourself up to the care of your wise old mother nature who will attend to your heart just as securely and serenely as she attended to it in the days before you were born by fasting i mean that you take no food whatever i know some nature cure teachers who practice what they call a fruit fast all i know is that if i eat nothing but fruit i soon have my stomach boiling with fermentation and also i suffer with hunger whereas if i take a complete fast i promptly forget all about food you must drink all the water you can on the fast this helps nature with her house cleaning it is well to drink a glass of water every half hour at least do not try to go without water and then write me that the fasting cure is a failure also please do not write and ask me if it will be fasting if you take just a little crackers and milk or some soup or something else that you think doesn't count i recommend a dose of laxative to clean out the system at the beginning of a fast because the bowels are apt to become sluggish at once and the quicker you get the system cleansed the better it does no good to take laxatives if you are going to pile in more food but if you are going to fast that is a different matter you should take a full warm enema every day during the fast so long as it brings any results there are some people whose bowels are so frightfully clogged that i have known the enema to bring results even in the second and third weeks on the other hand if there is no solid matter to be removed a small enema every day will suffice take a warm bath every day and needless to say you should get all the fresh air you can and should sleep as much as you can you may have difficulty in sleeping because the fast is apt to make you nervous and wakeful i have known people who could not fast because they could not sleep 
and I have taught them a little trick, to put a hot water bottle at the feet and another on the abdomen to draw the blood away from the head, so they would quickly fall asleep, and they got great benefit from their fasts. You should supply yourself with good music if you can, and with plenty of good reading matter. You will be amazed to find how active your mind becomes, because you had never known before what a mind you had. Your blood has always been so clogged with food poisons that you didn't know you could think. My three-act play, The Nature Woman, was conceived and written in two days and a half on a fast. But I do not recommend this kind of thing. On the contrary, I strongly urge against it, because if you work your brain on a fast, you do not get the good from your fast, and you do not recover so quickly. Put off all your problems until you have got your health back, and seek only to divert your mind while fasting. End of chapter 25 Chapter 26 Breaking the Fast Discusses various methods of building up the body after a fast, especially the milk diet. There remains the question of how to break the fast, and this is the most important part of the problem. You may undo all the good of your fast by breaking it wrong, and you are a thousand times as apt to kill yourself then as while you are fasting. When your hunger comes back, it comes back with a rush, and some people have not the willpower to control it. I do not advocate a complete fast in any case except of serious chronic disease and then only under the advice of someone with experience. But I advocate a short fast of a week or ten days for almost every common ailment, and I know that such a fast will help, even where it may not completely cure. You may go on fasting so long as you are quiet and happy, but when you find you are becoming too weak for comfort, or for the peace of mind of your family physician and your friends, you may break your fast and show them that it is possible to restore your strength and body weight, and then they won't bother so much when you try it again. Take nothing but liquid foods in the breaking of a fast. I recommend the juices of fruits and tomatoes, also meat broths. If you have fasted a week or two, take a quarter of a glass. If you have fasted a month, take a tablespoonful and wait and see what the results are. Remember that your whole alimentary track is out of action, and give it a chance to start up slowly. Take small quantities of liquid food every two hours for the first day, then you can begin taking larger quantities, and on the next day you can try some milk, or a soft poached egg, or the pulp of cooked apples or prunes. Do not take any solid food until you are quite sure you can digest it, and then take only a very little. Do not take any starchy food until the third day. I have known people to break these rules. I knew a man who broke his fast on a Hamburg steak, and he had to be helped out with a stomach pump. Once I broke a week's fast with a plate of rich soup, because I was at a friend's house and there was nothing else and I yielded to the claims of hospitality, and made myself ill, and had to fast for several days longer. The easiest way to break a fast is upon a milk diet. I have seen hundreds of people take this diet, and very few who did not get benefit. The first time I fasted, which was twelve days, I lost seventeen pounds, and I took the milk diet for twenty-four days thereafter and gained 32 pounds. I took it at McFadden's sanitarium, where I had every attention. Since then, I have many times tried to take a milk diet by myself, but have never been able to get it to agree with me. I do not know how to explain this fact. I state it, to show how hard it is to lay down general rules. On the milk diet, you take into your system two or three times as much food as you can assimilate, and this is a violation of all my diet rules, but it appears that the bacteria which thrive in milk produce lactic acid, which is not harmful to the system, 
and if you do not take other foods, you may safely keep the system flooded with milk. After a fast, you should begin with small quantities of milk, and by the third day you may be taking a full glass of warm milk every half hour or every twenty minutes, until you have taken seven or eight quarts per day. It is better to take it warm, but sometimes people take it just as well without warming. Dr. Porter, who has a book on the milk diet, insists upon complete rest and makes his patients stay in bed. McFadden, on the other hand, recommends gymnastics in the morning before the milk, and during the afternoon he recommends a rest from the milk for a couple of hours, followed by abdominal exercises to keep the bowels open. This is very important during a fast, because you are taking great quantities of material into your system, and it must not be permitted to clog. Therefore, take an enema daily, if necessary, to a free movement. Also, take a warm bath daily. Take the juice of oranges and lemons, if you crave them. Upon one thing, everyone who has had experience with the milk diet agrees, and that is the necessity of absolute mental rest. If you become excited, or nervous, or angry on a milk diet, you may turn all the contents of your stomach into hard curds, and may put yourself into convulsions. The wonderful thing about the milk diet is the state of physical and mental bliss it makes possible. It is the ideal way of breaking a fast, because it leaves you no chance to get hungry. You have all the food you want, and your system is bathed in happiness, a sense of peace and well-being which is truly marvelous and not to be described. You gain anywhere from a half a pound to two pounds a day, and you feel that you have never before in your life known what perfect health could be. The fast sets you a new standard. You discover how nature meant you to enjoy life, and never again are you content with that kind of half-existence with which you managed to worry along before you discovered this remedy. But let me hasten to add that I do not recommend the fast as a regular habit of life. The fast is an emergency measure to enable the body to cleanse itself and to cure disease. When you have got your body clean and free from disease, it is your business to keep it that way, and you should apply your reason to the problem of how to live so that you will not have to fast. If you find that you continue to have ailments, then you must be eating wrongly, or overworking, or committing some other offense against nature. Either that, or else you must have some organic trouble, a bone in your spine is out of place, as the osteopaths tell you, or your eyes out of focus, or your appendix twisted and infected. I do not claim that the fasting cure will supplant the surgeons and the oculists and the dentists. It will not mend your bones if you break them, and it will not repair your teeth, which are already decayed, but it will help to keep your teeth from decaying in the future, and it will help you to prepare for a surgical operation, and to recover from it more quickly. I had to undergo an operation for rupture a couple of years ago and I fasted for two days before the operation, and for three days after it, and I had no particle of nausea from the ether, and was able to tend to my mail the day after the operation. There is one disease for which I hesitate to recommend the fast, and that is tuberculosis, because I have been told of cases in which the patient lost weight and did not recover it. However, in my tabulation of 277 cases, you will note four cases of tuberculosis, and in my book is given a letter from a patient who claimed great benefit. If I had the misfortune to contract tuberculosis, I would take a three or four day rest, followed by a milk diet for a long period. The milk diet is pleasant to take, and it cannot possibly do any harm. If it did not affect a cure, I would try the Salisbury treatment, that is, lean meat ground up and medium cooked and nothing else, except an abundance of hot water between meals. Professor Irving Fisher wrote me that there is urgent need of experiment to determine proper diet in tuberculosis, 
and until these experiments have been made we can only grope i am quite sure that the stuffing system ordinarily used by doctors is a tragic mistake in the case of any other disease whatever even though i might take medical or surgical treatment i would supplement this by a fast because there is no kind of a treatment which does not succeed better with the blood in good condition in the case of emergencies accidents wounds etc i would rest assured that recovery would be more prompt if i were fasting when david graham phillips was shot i wrote a letter to the new york call saying that his doctors had killed him because they had fed him while he was lying in a critical condition in the hospital to take nutriment into the body under such circumstances is the greatest of blunders the fast will help children just as it helps adults only they do not need to fast so long it will help the aged and make them feel young you need not be afraid to fast no matter how old you are it is of course an immediate cure for fatness and strange as it may seem it is also a cure for unnatural thinness people with ravenous appetites are just as apt to be thin as to be fat because it is not what you eat that builds up your body but only what you assimilate and if you eat too much you can make it impossible to assimilate anything properly if you take a fast and break it carefully your body will come to its normal weight and all your functions to their normal activity a physician wrote me taking me to task for listing among the cures reported in my tabulation a case of locomotor ataxia this disease he explained is caused because a portion of a nerve has been entirely destroyed and it is a disease that is absolutely and positively and forever incurable I answered that I knew this to be the teaching of present-day medical science, but I invited him to consider for a moment what happens in nature. When a crab loses a claw, we do not take it as a matter of course that the crab must go about with one claw for the balance of his life. Nature will make that crab another claw. Man has lost the power of replacing a lost leg, but he still retains the power of replacing tissue which has been cut away by a surgeon's knife and medical science takes this as a matter of course how shall anybody say that nature has forever lost the power of rebuilding a bit of nervous tissue how shall anyone say that if the bloodstream is cleansed of poisons and the energy of the whole body restored one of the results may not be the repairing of a broken nerve connection I invite my readers who have ailments, and especially I invite all medical men among my readers, to make a fair test of the fasting cure. The results will surprise them, and they will quickly be forced to revise their methods of treating illness. End of chapter 26 Chapter 27 of the Book of Life by Upton Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 27 Diseases and Cures. Discusses some of the commoner human ailments and what is known about their cause and cure. I begin with the commonest of all troubles, known as a cold this name implies that the cause of the trouble lies in exposure or chill all the grandmothers of the world are agreed about this they have a phrase or at least they had it when i was a boy you will catch your death every time i went out in the rain every time i played with wet feet or sat in a draft or got under a cold shower i would hear the formula you will catch your death and on the other hand, there are the health cranks, who declare vehemently that the name cold is a misnomer and a trap for people's thoughts. Cold has nothing to do with it, they say, and point to Arctic explorers who frequently got frozen to death, but do not catch cold, 
until they get back into the warm rooms of civilization. As for drafts, the health cranks aver that a draft is merely fresh air moving, which is supposed to settle the matter. However, when you come to think about it, you realize that a cyclone is likewise merely fresh air moving, so you have not decided the question by a phrase. While I was writing these chapters on health, I contracted a severe cold, which was a joke on me. The history of this cold is as clear in my mind as anything human can be, and it will serve for an illustration, showing how much truth the grandmothers have on their side, and how much the health cranks have. To begin with, I had been overworking. All sorts of appeals come to me. Hundreds of people write me letters, and I cannot bear to leave them unanswered. I accepted calls to speak, and invitations where I had to eat a lot of stuff of which my reason disapproves, so one morning I woke up with a slight sore throat. I fasted all day, and by evening felt all right. But there came another call, and I consented to take a long automobile ride on a cold and rainy night, and when I got back home after five or six hours, I was thoroughly chilled, and my cold came on during the night. This explanation will, I imagine, be satisfactory to all the grandmothers of the world. All the dear, good grandmothers know that an automobile ride on a cold, rainy night is enough to give any man his death. But listen, grandmothers, I have lain out watching for deer all night in the late fall, with only a thin blanket to cover me, and gotten up so stiff with cold that I could hardly move, yet I did not catch cold. When I was a youth, I have ridden a bicycle twenty miles to the beach in April, with snow on the ground, and plunged into the surf and swam, and then ridden home again. I have bathed in the sea when I had to run a quarter of a mile in a bathing suit along a frost-covered pier, and with an icy wind blowing through my bones, yet I never took cold from that, and never got anything but a feeling of exhilaration. So it must be that there is some reason why exposure causes colds at one time, and not at another. The explanation takes you over to the health cranks. They understand that your bloodstream must be clogged, your bodily tone reduced by bad air and lack of exercise, and more especially by overeating or by an improperly balanced diet. But then most of them go to extremes, and insist that the automobile ride and the chilled condition of my body had nothing to do with my cold. But I know otherwise. I have watched the thing happen so often. In times when I was run down, the slightest exposure would cause me a cold, literally, in a few minutes. I have got myself a sore throat going out to the woodpile on a winter day with nothing on my head. I have got a cold by sitting still with wet feet, or by sitting in a draft on a warm summer day when I had been perspiring a little. How to explain this I am not sure, but my guess is that you drive the blood away from the surface of the body at a time when it is weakened and exposed to infection, and you drive away the army of the white corpuscles and give the battlefield of your body to the germs. I know there are nature curists who argue that germs have nothing to do with disease, but they have never been able to convince me. Germs are too real, and too many, and too easy to watch. If you leave a piece of meat exposed to the air in warm temperature, the germs in the air will settle upon it and begin to feed upon it and to multiply. The meat, being dead, is powerless to protect itself. But your nose and throat are also meat, and just as good food for those germs. The only difference is that this meat is alive. There is a living bloodstream circulating through it, and several score billions of the body's own kind of germs, the blood corpuscles. If these blood corpuscles are sound and properly nourished, and are brought to the place of infection, they are able to destroy all the common germs. So it is that you do not have diseases, but instead have health. 
but your health always implies a struggle of your organism against other organisms and it is the business of your reason to watch your body and give all the help you can in protecting it coughs and colds sore throats and headaches are the first warnings that your defenses are being weakened as a rule these ailments are not serious in themselves but they are signs of a wrong condition and if you neglect this condition pretty soon you will find that you have to deal with something deadly my cure for a cold is to take an enema and a laxative eat nothing for twenty-four hours and drink plenty of water if you have a severe cold or sore throat you will be wise to lie in bed for a day or two by an open window you may also use sprays and gargles if you wish but you will find them of little use because the germs are deep in your mucous membranes and cannot all be reached from the outside in the old sad days of my ignorance i would get a cold and go to the doctor and have my throat and nose pumped full of black and green and yellow and purple liquids which did me absolutely no good whatever the cold would stay on for two or three weeks sometimes for eight or ten weeks and i would be miserable utterly desperate i was dying by inches and not one of the doctors could tell me why the next most common ailment is a headache and this means poisons in your bloodstream it may be from improper diet from alcohol or drugs or bad air or nervous excitement if it is none of these things then you should begin to look for some organic difficulty eye strain for example or perhaps defects in the spine the osteopaths and the chiropractors specialize on the spine and have made important discoveries their doctrine is in brief that the nervous force which directs the bloodstream is carried to the organs of the body by nerves which leave the spinal cord through openings between the vertebrae if any of these openings are pinched you have a diminished nerve supply which means ill health in that part of the body to which the nerve leads that such trouble can be corrected by straightening the bones of the spine seems perfectly reasonable but like most people with a new idea the discoverers proceed to carry it to absurd extremes i have before me an official chiropractic pamphlet which states that vertebral displacement is the physical and perpetuating cause of ninety five per cent of all cases of disease the remaining five per cent being due to subluxations of other skeletal segments and naturally people who believe this will devote nearly all their study to the bones and the nervous system but surely there are other parts of your body which are necessary besides bones and nerves and what if some of these parts happen to be malformed and effective what if your eyes do not focus properly and you are continually wearing out the optic nerve thus giving yourself headaches and neurasthenia what if you have an appendix that has been twisted and malformed from birth and is a center of infection so long as it remains in the body several years ago i had an experience with the appendix from which i learned something about one of the commonest human ailments constipation or sluggishness of the bowels this is a cause of innumerable chronic ailments grouped under the head of auto intoxication or the poisoning of the body by the absorption into the system of the products of fermentation and decay in the bowels the bowel should move freely two or three times every day and the movement should be soft i suffered from constipation for some twenty years and tried i think every remedy known to science and to crank them in the beginning the doctors gave me drugs which by irritating the intestinal walls caused them to pour out quantities of water and hurry the irritating substances down the intestinal tract that is all right for an emergency if you have swallowed a poison or food which is spoiled or if you have overeaten and are ill get your system cleaned out by any and every device but if you habitually swallow mild poisons which is what all laxatives are you weaken the intestinal tract and you have to take more and more of these poisons and you get less results 
we may set down as positive the statement that drugs are not a remedy for constipation. Next comes diet. Eat the rough and bulky foods, save the nature curists, and stimulate the intestinal walls to activity. I tried that. I listened to the extreme enthusiast, and boiled whole wheat and ate it, and consumed quantities of bran biscuit, and of a Japanese seaweed, which Dr. Kellogg prepares, and of petroleum oil, and even the skins of oranges, which are most uncomfortable eating. I assure you, I would eat things like this until I got myself a case of diarrhea, and so was cured of constipation for a time. Strange as it may seem to you, there are even people who tell you to eat sand. I listened to them, and ate many quarts. And then there is exercise. McFadden taught me a whole series of exercises for developing the muscles of the abdominal walls and the back, which are greatly neglected by civilized man. The fundamental cause of constipation is a sluggish life, and to exercise our bodies is a duty. But to me, it was always an agony of boredom to lie on a bed and wiggle my abdomen for a quarter of an hour. The same thing applies to hot water treatments, which are effective, but a nuisance and a waste of time. I never could keep them up, except when I was in trouble. Three or four years ago, I began to notice a continual irritating pain on my right side, which I quickly realized must lie in the appendix. I tried massage, and hot and cold water treatments, and my favorite remedy, a week's fast. The pain disappeared, but it returned, so finally I decided, to the dismay of my physical culture friends, to have the appendix out. For years I had been reading the statements of nature curists that the appendix is an important and vital part of the body, which pours an oil or something into the intestinal tract, and so helps to prevent constipation. Well, evidently my appendix wasn't doing its job, so I took it to a good surgeon. What I found was that it had been twisted and malformed from birth, so that it was a center of continuous infection. From the time that I had the operation, I have never had to think about the subject of constipation. This experience suggests to me how easy it is for people to make statements about health which have no relationship to facts. I do not recommend promiscuous surgery, and I perfectly well realize that if human beings would take proper care of their health, the great proportion of surgical operations would be unnecessary. I realize also that surgeons get paid by the job, and therefore have a money interest in operating, and it is perfectly futile to expect that none of them will ever be influenced by the profit motive. Nevertheless, it is true that sometimes surgical operations are necessary, and that by standing a little temporary inconvenience, you can save yourself a lifetime of discomfort. Take, for example, rupture. The human body has here a natural weakness from which there results a dangerous and uncomfortable affliction. Hundreds of thousands of men are going around all their lives wearing elaborate and expensive trusses, which are almost, if not entirely, useless, and trying advertised cures, which are entirely fakes. An operation takes an hour or two and two or three weeks in bed, and when our government drafted its young men into the army and found that fourteen in every thousand of them had rupture, it shipped them into hospitals wholesale and sewed them up. It happens that rupture affords one case where scar tissue is stronger than natural tissue, and there were practically no returns from the great number of army cases. Likewise, you find extreme statements repeated concerning the evils of vaccination. But if you will read Parkman's History of the Jesuits in North America, you will see the horrible conditions under which the Indians lived in the United States. Noble savages, you understand, entirely uncontaminated by civilized white men, and whole populations regularly wiped out every few years by epidemics of smallpox. That these epidemics ceased, 
was due to the discovery that by infecting the body with a mild form of the disease, it could be made to develop substances which render it immune to the deadly form. Here in California, we have a law which makes vaccination for school children optional, and so we may someday have another epidemic to test the theories of the anti-vaccinationists. I know, of course, the dreadful stories of people who have been given syphilis and other diseases by impure vaccines. I don't know whether such stories are true, but I do know that people who live in houses are sometimes killed by earthquakes and by lightning, yet we do not cease to live in houses because of this chance. It seems to me that the remedy for such vaccination evils is not to abolish vaccination, but to take more care in the manufacture of our vaccines. This danger is removed by using vaccines which are sterile and are made especially for each person. Germs are taken from the sick person and injected into an animal. The body of the animal develops with great rapidity the antibodies necessary to resistance to the germs. And as these antibodies are chemical products not affected by heat, we can take a serum from the animal, sterilize it, and then inject it into the system of the patient, thus increasing resistance to the disease. I admit that the best way to increase such resistance is to take care of your health. But sometimes we confront an emergency, and we must use emergency remedies. We have serums that really cure diphtheria and meningitis, and one that will prevent lockjaw. Anyone who has ever seen with his own eyes how the deadly membranes of diphtheria melt away as a result of an injection will be less dogmatic about the efforts of science to combat disease. Of course it is much pleasanter if you can destroy the source of the disease and keep it from getting into the human body. Every few years the southern part of our country used to be devastated by yellow fever epidemics. Every kind of weird and fantastic remedy was tried. People would go around with sponges full of vinegar hung under their noses. They would burn the clothing and bedding of those who died of the disease. They would wear gloves when they went shopping, so as not to touch the money with their hands. But at last, medical experimenters traced the disease to a certain kind of mosquito. And now... If we drain the swamps and screen our houses and stay indoors after sundown, we do not get yellow fever, nor malaria either. In the same way, if we keep our bodies clean with soap and hot water, we do not get bitten by lice, and so do not die of typhus. If we take pains with our drains and water supply so that human excrement does not get into it, and if we destroy the filth-carrying housefly, we do not have epidemics of typhoid. But under conditions of battle, it is not possible for men to take these precautions. And so when they go into the army, they get a dose of typhoid serum. And this illustrates the difference between a true or hygienic remedy for a disease and a temporary or emergency remedy. If you say that you want to abolish war, and with it, the need for typhoid vaccination, I cheerfully agree with you in this. All I am trying to do is to point out the folly of flying to extremes and rejecting any remedy which may help. What is the use of making the flat statement that vaccinations and serums never aid in the cure of disease, when any man can see with his own eyes the proof that they do? In the Spanish War, before typhoid vaccination, many times more soldiers died of this disease than died of bullets. But in the late war, there was practically no typhoid at all in the army camps. On the other hand, it was noticed that the men who had just come in, and who therefore had just been vaccinated, were considerably more susceptible to influenza which shows that vaccination does reduce the body condition for a time. The reader may say that in this case I am trying to sit on both sides of the fence. But the truth is that I am trying to keep an open mind and to consider all the facts and to avoid making rash statements. 
one of the statements you hear most frequently is that drugs can never remedy disease or help in remedying it now i abhor the drugging system of the orthodox medical men i have talked with them and heard them talk with one another and i know that they will mix up half a dozen different substances in the vague hope that some one of them will have some effect even when they know definitely the effects they are producing they are in many cases merely suppressing symptoms on the other hand however it is a fact that medical science has had for a generation or two a specific which destroys the germs of one disease in the blood without at the same time injuring the blood itself that disease is malaria and the drug is quinine of course the way to avoid malaria is to drain the swamps but you cannot do that all at once nor can you always screen your house and stay in at sundown when you first go into a country you have no house to screen and some emergency will certainly arise that exposes you to mosquito bites so you will need quinine and will be foolish not to use it and know how to use it recent medical chemists discovered another remedy this time for syphilis it is called salvarsan and while it does not always cure it frequently does in laboratories today men are working over the problem of constructing a combination of molecules which will destroy the germ of sleeping sickness without at the same time injuring the blood if they find it they will save hundreds of millions of lives i do not see why we cannot recognize such a possibility while at the same time making use of physical culture of diet and fasting when the manuscript of this book was sent to the printer there appeared in this place a paragraph telling of the work of dr albert abrams of san francisco in the diagnosis and cure of disease by means of radioactive vibrations as the book is going to press the writer finds himself in san francisco attending dr abrams clinics and so he finds it possible to give a more extended account of some fascinating discoveries which seemed destined to revolutionize medical science if i were to tell you all that i have seen with my own eyes in the last twelve days i fear the reader would find his powers of credulity overstretched so i shall content myself with trying to tell in very sober and cautious language the theory upon which abrams is working and the technique which he has evolved modern science has demonstrated that all matter is simply the activity of electrons minute particles of electric force this is a statement which no present-day physicist would dispute the best evidence appears to indicate that a molecule of matter is a minute reproduction of the universe a system of electrons whirling about a central nucleus no eye has ever beheld an electron for it is billions of times smaller than anything the microscope makes visible but we can see the effects of electronic activity and all modern books of physics give photographs of such it is possible to determine the vibration rates of electrons and to dr abrams occurred the idea of determining the vibration rates of diseased tissue and disease germs he discovered that it was invariably the same not merely does all cancerous material for example yield the same rate but the blood of a person suffering from cancer yields that rate at all times and under all circumstances the vibration of cancer of tuberculosis of syphilis each is different uniform and invariable likewise in the blood are other vibrations uniform and dependable which reveal the sex and age of the patient the virulence of the disease and the period of its duration yes and even the location in the body if there be some definite infected area so here is a modern miracle an infallible device for the diagnosis of disease dr abrams does not have to see the patient all he has to have is a drop of blood on a piece of white blotting paper 
and he sits in his laboratory and tells all about it, and somewhere several thousand miles away in Toronto or Boston or New Orleans a surgeon operates and finds what he has been told is there. And that is only the beginning of the wonder, because, says Abrams, if you know the vibration rate of the electrons of germs, you can destroy those germs. It used to be a favorite trick of Caruso to tap a glass and determine its musical note and then sing that note at the glass and shatter it to bits. It is well known that horses, trotting swiftly on a bridge, have sometimes coincided in their step with the vibration of the bridge and thus have broken it down. On that same principle, this wizard of the electron introduces into your body radioactivity of a certain rate. And shall I say that he cures cancer and syphilis and tuberculosis of many years standing in a few treatments? I will not say that, because you would not and could not believe me. I will content myself with the telling what my wife and I have been watching twice a day for the past twelve days. The scene is a laboratory, with rows of raised seats at one side for the physicians who attend the clinic. There is a table, with the instruments of measurement, and Dr. Abrams sits beside it, and before him stands a young man stripped to the waist. The doctor is tapping upon the abdomen of this man, and listening to the sounds. You will find this the weirdest part of the whole procedure, for you will naturally assume that this young man is being examined and will be dazed when someone explains that the patient is in Toronto or Boston or New Orleans, and that this young man's body is the instrument which the doctor uses in the determining of the vibration rates of the patient's blood. Dr. Abrams tried numerous instruments, but has been able to find nothing so sensitive to electronic activity as a human body. He explains to his classes that the spinal cord is composed of millions of nerve fibers of different vibration rates. Hence, a certain rate communicated to the body is automatically sorted out and appears on a certain precise spot of the body in the form of increased activity, increased blood pressure in the cells, and hence what all physicians know as a dull area, which can be discovered by what is known as percussion, a tapping with the finger. To map out these areas is merely a matter of long and patient experiment, and Abrams has been studying the subject for some twenty years. He is author of a textbook on what is known as the reactions of Abrams. So now he provides the world with a series of maps of the human body, and he sits in front of his subject, and his assistant places a specimen of blood in a little electrically connected box and sets the rheostat at some vibration number, say 50, and Dr. Abrams taps on a certain square inch of the abdomen of his subject and announces the dread word, cancer. Then he places the electrode on another part of the subject's body and taps some more and announces that it is cancer of the small intestine, left side, some more tapping, and he announces that its intensity is 12 ohms, which is severe, and pretty soon there is speeding a telegram to the physician who has sent this blood specimen, telling him these facts, and prescribing a certain vibration rate upon the oscilloclast, the instrument of radioactivity which Dr. Abrams has devised. Now, you watch this thing for an hour or two, and you say to yourself, here is either the greatest magician in the history of mankind, or else the greatest maniac. You may have come prepared for some kind of fraud, but you soon dismiss that, for you realize that this man is desperately in earnest about what he is doing, and so are all the physicians who watch him. So you seek refuge in the thought that he must be deluding himself and them, perhaps unconsciously. But you talk with these men and discover that they have come from all over the country and always for one reason. They had sent blood specimens to Abrams and found that he had never made a mistake. He told them more from a few drops of the patient's blood than they themselves had been able to find out from the whole patient. And then into the clinic come the doctor's own patients. I must have heard 60 or 
80 of them tell their story, and many of them have been lifted from the grave. People ten years blind from syphilis who can see. People operated on several times for cancer and given up for dying. People with tumors on the brain, or with one lung gone from tuberculosis. It is literally a fact that when you have sat in Abrams' clinic for a week, all disease loses its terrors. This, you see, is really the mastery of life. If we can measure and control the minute universe of the electron and the atom, we have touched the ultimate source of our bodily life. I might take chapters of this book to tell you of the strange experiments I have seen in this clinic, showing you, for instance, how these vibrations respond to thought. How by denying to himself the disease, the patient can, for a few moments, cancel in his body the activity of the harmful germs, showing how the reactions differ in the different sexes and at different ages, and how they respond to different colors and different drugs. Abram's method has revealed the secret of such efficacy as drugs possess. Their work is done by their radioactivity, and not by their chemical properties. Also, the problem of vaccination has been solved, for Abrams has discovered a dread new disease, which is bovine syphilis, originally caused in cattle by human inoculation, and now reintroduced into the human being by vaccination, and becoming the agent which prepares the soil of the body for such disorders as tuberculosis and cancer. And it appears that we can all be rendered immune to these diseases by a few electronic vibrations introduced into our bodies in childhood. So is opened up to our eyes a wonderful vision of a new race, purified and made fit for life. So here at last is science justified of her optimism, and our faith in human destiny forever vindicated. Take my advice, whoever you may be that are suffering, and find out about this new work and help to make it known to the world. There are many romances of medical science, some of them as fascinating as murder mysteries and big game hunting. Turn to McMaster's History of the People of the United States and read his account of the terrible epidemic of yellow fever in Philadelphia a hundred years ago. I have already referred to the weird and incredible things that people did in their effort to ward off this plague sponges of vinegar under their noses, and fever fires burning in the streets. And then a mosquito would fly up and bite them, and in a few hours they would be dead. Or what could be stranger than the tracing of the bubonic plague, which has cost literally billions of human lives, to a parasite in the blood of fleas which live on the bodies of rats? Or what could be more unexpected than the tracing of our rheumatic aches and twinges to the root canals of the teeth? One of the most common ailments which afflict poor humanity is rheumatism, a cause of endless suffering. It was supposed to be due to damp climate and exposure, and this is true to a certain extent, in the same way that colds are due to exposure. But the investigators realized that there must be some bodily condition rendering one susceptible, and they set to work to trace this condition down. The pains of rheumatism are caused by uric acid settling in the joints of the body. What causes the uric acid? Well, there is uric acid in red meat, so let us forbid rheumatic people to eat it. But this is overlooking the fact that the human body itself is a uric acid factory, and also the fact that uric acid taken into the stomach may not remain uric acid by the time it gets to the bloodstream. We know that you may eat a great deal of fruit acid without necessarily making acid blood. On the other hand, you can make acid blood by eating a lot of sugar. So you see, it isn't as simple as it sounds. Rheumatism has been traced to its lair, which is found to be the roots of the teeth. Here is a part of the body difficult to get at, and as a consequence of bad diet and unwholesome ways of living, infections will start there, and pus sacs be formed, 
and the poisons absorbed into the bloodstream and distributed throughout the body. The first thought is to draw the infected teeth, but that is a serious matter because you need your teeth to chew your food. So the dentist has to go through a complicated process of opening up the tooth and cleaning out the root canals and treating the infected spots at the roots. Then he has to fill the tooth all the way down to the roots, leaving no place for infection to gather. This, of course, takes time and costs money, and is one more illustration of the fact that there is one health law for the rich and another health law for the poor. All the time that I write these chapters about health, I feel guilty. I know that the wholesome food I recommend costs money, and I know that surgery and dentistry cost money. Yes, even sunlight and fresh air and recreation, even a fast, because you have to rest while you take it, and you have to have a roof over your head, and warmth in winter time, and somebody to wait upon you when you are weak. I know that for a great many of the people who read what I write, all these things are impossible of attainment. I know that for the great majority of the common people the benefits of science do not exist. Science discovers how to prevent disease, but the discoveries are not applied, because the profit system controls the world, and the profit system wants the labor of the poor, regardless of what happens to their health. If the people fall ill, they are thrown upon the scrap heap, and the profit system finds others to take their place. Take, for example, tuberculosis. Tuberculosis is a germ infection, but it practically never gets hold upon a human body except when the body is reduced by undernourishment and lack of fresh air. Tuberculosis, therefore, is a disease of slums and jails. It is definitely and indisputably a disease of poverty. It could be wiped off the face of the earth in a single generation, and the same is true of typhus and typhoid. There's another whole host of ailments which could be wiped out by measures of public hygiene, plus education. This includes all the infant diseases and the deadly venereal diseases, but the profit system stands in the way. And so, in these closing paragraphs of this book of the body, I say that there is one disease which is the deadliest of all, and the source of all others, and that disease is poverty. I know a certain physician to the rich, who is an honest and conscientious man. He said, I loathe my work. I am wasting my time. I am called in by these fat, overfed, rich people in their leisure class hotels, and what am I to say to them? Shall I say to them, you are living an abnormal life, and you can never be well until you cut out the root and branch of all your habits of self-indulgence which are destroying you? But no, I can't say that. Not one time in a thousand. I am expected to be polite and serious and to listen to them while they tell me their long, tiresome story of their symptoms, and I have to encourage them and give them some temporary device that will remove some of the symptoms of their trouble. And what should one say to this honest physician? Should one tell him to go and be a physician to the poor? Would he be any happier there? He could tell the poor the causes of their diseases, and they would listen patiently. They are trained to listen and to accept what they are told. Here is a girl living in an inside bedroom in a tenement and working ten or eleven hours a day in an unventilated factory, and she is ill with tuberculosis. The physician tells her that she needs plenty of fresh air and rest and a lot of eggs and milk in her diet. He tells her that, and he knows that she has as much chance of carrying out his orders as of flying to the moon. Or maybe he comes upon a typhoid epidemic and discovers, as happened to a friend of mine in Chicago, that there is defective plumbing in some houses owned by the political leader of the district. Or maybe it is a case of venereal disease in a young man who is drafted into the army and turned loose amid the joys of Paris. Maybe it is just a commonplace, everyday story of a room full of school children, 22% of them undernourished, as is the case in New York City, and the parents out of work, 
part of the time and with no possibility in their lives of ever earning enough to feed the children properly when you confront these universal facts of our present social order you realize that the problem of disease is not merely a problem of the body but is a problem of the mind as well a problem of politics and religion and philosophy of the whole way of thinking of the so-called civilized world a book of health which did not point out these facts would be not a book of health but a book of sham but meantime while we are trying to change the world's ideas we have to live and we can do our work better if we keep as well as possible i have tried to point out the way it is as you can see a matter in part of the body and in part of the mind all the bodily regime here laid out has its basis in mental habits all wise and wholesome ways of life can at the age when our minds are plastic be made into second nature things which we do automatically without effort or temptation to do otherwise this is the real secret of true happiness in the conduct of our personal lives to acquire self-control to rule our desires and our passions not harshly and spasmodically but serenely as one drives a car which he thoroughly understands it is in vain that we preach freedom to men who have not this self-mastery as the poet tells us the sensual and the dark rebel in vain slaves of their own compulsion and of all the personal possessions which man can attain on this earth the most precious is the one of a sound mind controlling a sound body i close this book by quoting some verses written by sir henry wotton three hundred years ago which i have all my life considered one of the noblest pieces of poetry in our heritage the character of a happy life how happy is he born and taught that serveth not another's will whose armor is his honest thought and simple truth his utmost skill whose passions not his masters are whose soul is still prepared for death not tied unto the world with care of public fame or private breath who envies none that chance doth raise or vice who never understood how deepest wounds are given by praise nor rules of state but rules of good who hath his life from rumors freed whose conscience is his strong retreat whose state can neither flatter earth's feed nor ruin make accusers great who god doth late and early pray more of his grace than gifts to land and entertains the harmless day with a well-chosen book or friend this man is freed from servile bands of hope to rise or fear to fall lord of himself though not of lands and having nothing yet hath all end of chapter 27 end of book 2 the book of the body part 3 the book of love chapters 28 and 29 of the book of life by upton sinclair this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 28. The Reality of Marriage. Discusses the sex customs now existing in the world and their relation to the ideal of monogamous love. Just as human beings, through wrong religious beliefs, torture one another and wreck their lives and happiness, just as through wrong eating and other physical habits they make disease and misery for themselves just so they suffer and perish for lack of the most elementary knowledge concerning the sex relationship the difference is that in the field of religious ideas it is now permissible to impart the truth one possesses if i tell you there is no devil 
and that believing this will not cause you to suffer in an eternity of sulfur and brimstone, no one will be able to burn me at the stake, even though he might like to do so. If I advise you that it is not harmful to eat beefsteak on Friday, or to eat thoroughly cooked pork on any day of the week, neither the archbishops nor the rabbis nor the vegetarians will be able to lock me in a dungeon. But if I should impart to you the simplest and most necessary bit of knowledge concerning the facts of your sex life, things which every man and woman must know if we are to stop breeding imbecility and degeneracy in the world, then I should be liable, under federal statutes, to pay a fine of $5,000 and to serve a term of five years in a federal penitentiary. Scarcely a week passes that I do not receive a letter from someone asking for information about such matters. But I dare not answer the letters, because I know there are agencies, maintained and paid by religious superstition, employing spies to trap people into the breaking of this law. I shall tell you here, as much as I am permitted to tell, in the simplest language and the most honest spirit. I believe that human beings are meant to be happy on this earth, and to avoid misery and disease. I believe that they are given the powers of intelligence in order to seek the ways of happiness, and I believe that it is a worthy work to give them the knowledge they need in order to find happiness. At the outset of this book of love, we are going to examine the existing facts of the sex relationships of men and women in present-day society. We shall discover that amid all the false and dishonest thinking of mankind, there is nowhere more falsity and dishonesty than here. The whole world is a gigantic conspiracy of hush, and the orthodox and respectable of the world are like worshippers of some god, who spend their daytime burning incense before the altar, and in the nighttime steal the sacred jewels and devour the consecrated offerings. These worshippers confront you with the question, do you believe in marriage? And they make the assumption that the institution of marriage exists, or at some time has existed, in the world. But if you wish to do any sound thinking about the subject, you must get one thing clear at the outset. The institution of marriage is an ideal which has been preached and taught but which has never anywhere in any society at any stage of human progress actually existed as the general practice of mankind. What has existed and still exists is a very different institution, which I shall here describe as marriage plus prostitution. By this statement, I do not mean to deny that there are many women and a few men who have been monogamous all their lives, nor that there are many couples living together happily in monogamous marriage. What I mean is that considering society as a whole, wherever you find the institution of marriage, you also find, coexistent therewith and complementary thereto, the institution of prostitution. Of this double arrangement, one part is recognized and written into the law, and the other part is hidden and prohibited by law. But those who have to do with enforcing the law all know that it exists, and practically all of them consider it inevitable, and a great many derive income from it. So I say, if you believe in marriage plus prostitution, that is your right. But if marriage is what you believe in, then your task is to consider such questions as these. Is marriage a possible thing? Can it ever become the sex arrangement of any society? What are the forces which have so far prevented it from prevailing, and how can these forces be counteracted? It is my belief that monogamous love is the most desirable of human sex relationships, the most fruitful in happiness and spiritual development, 
the laws and institutions of civilized society pretend to defend this relationship but the briefest study of the facts will convince anyone that these laws and institutions are not really meant to protect monogamous love what they are is a device of the property-holding male to secure his property rights to women and more especially to secure himself as to the paternity of his heirs in primitive society where land and other sources of wealth were held in common and sex monogamy was unknown there was no way to determine paternity and no reason for doing so but under the system of private property and class privilege it is necessary for some one man to support a child if it is to be supported and when a man has fought hard and robbed hard and traded hard and acquired wealth he does not want to spend it in maintaining another man's child that he should let himself be fooled into doing so is one of the greatest humiliations his fellow man can imagine if you read shakespeare's plays and look up the meaning of old words so as to understand old witticisms and allusions you will discover that this was the stock jest of shakespeare's time in order to protect himself from such ridicule the man maintained in ancient times his right to kill the faithless woman with cruel tortures he maintains today the right to deprive her of her children and of all share in his property even though she may have helped to earn it but until quite recent times the beginning of the revolt of women there was never any corresponding penalty for faithlessness in husbands under the english law today the husband may divorce his wife for infidelity but the wife must prove infidelity plus cruelty and the courts have held that the cruelty must consist in knocking her down while i was in england the highest court rendered a decision that a man who brought his mistress to his home and compelled his wife to wait upon her was not committing cruelty in the meaning of the english law this is what is known as the double standard and the double standard prevails everywhere under the system of marriage plus prostitution and proves that capitalist monogamy is not a spiritual ideal but a matter of class privilege it is a breach of honor for the ruling class male to tamper with the wife of his friend it is frequently dangerous for him to tamper with the young females of his own class but it is in general practice taken for granted that the young females of lower classes are his legitimate prey in england a man may have a marriage annulled if he can prove that the woman he married had what is called a past but everybody takes it for granted that the man has had a past it is covered by the polite phrase sowing his wild oats wherever among the ruling class you find men bold enough to discuss the facts of the sex order they have set up you find the idea expressed or implied that this wild oats is a necessary and inevitable part of this order and that without it the order would break down the english philosopher lecky making an elaborate study of morals through the ages speaks of the prostitute in the following frank language herself the supreme type of vice she is ultimately the most efficient guardian of virtue but for her the unchallenged purity of countless happy homes would be polluted and not a few who in the pride of their untempted chastity think of her with an indignant shudder would have known the agony of remorse and despair on that one degraded and ignoble form are concentrated the passions that might have filled the world with shame she remains while creeds and civilizations rise and fall the eternal priestess of humanity blasted for the sins of the people i invite you to study these sentences and understand them fully remember 
that they are the opinion of the most learned historian of sex customs who has ever written in english a man whose authority is recognized in our schools whose books are in every college library william edward hartpool lecky is not in any sense a revolutionist he is a conventional english scholar an upholder of english law and order and patriotism he is not of my school of thought but of those who now own the world and run it i quote him because he tells in plain language what kind of world they have made i invite you to study his words and then judge my statement that the sex arrangement under which we live in modern society is not monogamous love but marriage plus prostitution it is my hope to point the way to a higher system i should like to call it marriage but perhaps it would be more precise to call it marriage minus prostitution in working it out we shall have to think for ourselves and discard all formulas it is obvious that our present-day religious creeds ethical ideals legal codes and social rewards and punishments have been powerless to protect marriage or to make it the rule in sex relationships so we shall have to begin at the beginning and find new reasons for monogamous love a new basis for marriage other than the protection of private property we shall have to inform ourselves as to the fundamental purposes of sex we shall have to ask ourselves what are the factors which determine rightness and wrongness in the sex relationship what is love and what ought it to be these questions we shall try to approach without any fixed ideas whatever we shall decide them by the same tests that we have used in our thinking about god and immortality health and disease we shall ask not what our ancestors believed not what god teaches us not what the law ordains not what is respectable nor yet what is advanced according to the claim of modern sex revolutionists and free lovers we shall ask ourselves what are the facts we shall ask what can be made to work in practice what can justify itself by the tests of reason and common sense end of chapter 28 chapter 29 the development of marriage deals with the sex relationship its meaning and its history the stages of its development in human society what in the most elemental form is sex it is a difference of function which makes it necessary for two organisms to take part in the reproduction of the species the purpose or at any rate the effect of this sex difference is the mixing of characteristics and qualities if the sex relationship were unnecessary to reproduction variations might begin and be propagated and carried to extremes in one line of inheritance without ever affecting the rest of the species very soon there would be no species or rather an infinity of them each line of descent would fly apart and become a group all by itself you have perhaps heard people comment on the fact that blondes so frequently prefer brunettes and that tall men are apt to marry short women and vice versa this is perhaps nature's way of keeping the type uniform of spreading qualities widely and testing them thoroughly nature is continually trying out the powers of every individual in every species and by the process of sexual selection she chooses for the reproduction of the species the individuals which are best fitted for survival this of course refers to nature considered apart from man in human society as i shall presently show sexual selection has been distorted and partly suppressed sex differentiation and sexual selection exist almost universally throughout the animal and vegetable kingdoms everywhere save in the lowest forms of being they take strange and startling forms and like everything else in nature 
manifest amazing ingenuity. People who wish to prove this or that about human sex relations will advance arguments from nature, but, as a matter of fact, we can learn nothing whatever from nature, except her determination to preserve the products of her activity and to keep them up to standard. Sometimes nature will give the precedence in power, speed, and beauty to the male, and sometimes to the female. She is perfectly ruthless and willing in the accomplishment of her purpose to destroy the individuals of either sex. She will content the most rabid feminist by causing the female spider to devour her mate when his purpose has been accomplished, or by causing the male bee to fall from his mating in the air, a disemboweled shell. As for man, he has won his supremacy over nature by his greater power to combine in groups, by his more intense gregarious or herd instincts, which enabled him to fight and destroy creatures which would have exterminated him if he had fought them alone. So in primitive society everywhere, we find that the individual is subordinated to the group, and the folk ways give but little heed to personal rights. Very thorough investigations have been made into the life of primitive man in many parts of the world, and the anthropologists are now arguing over the exact meaning of the data. We shall not here attempt to decide among them, but rest content with the statement that communism and tribal ownership is a widespread social form among primitive man, so much so as to suggest that it is an early stage in social evolution. And this communism includes not merely property, but sex. In the very earliest days there was often no barrier whatever to the sex relationship, not even between brothers and sisters, nor between parents and children. In fact, we find savages who do not know that the sex relationship has anything to do with procreation. But as knowledge increases, sex taboos develop, some wise and some foolish. From causes not entirely clear, but which we discuss in chapter 48, there gradually evolves a widespread form of sex relationship of primitive man, the system of the gents, as it is called. This is the Latin word for family, but it does not mean family in the narrow sense of mother and father and children but in the broad sense of all those who have blood relationship, however far removed, uncles and aunts and cousins, as far as memory can trace. In primitive communism, a man is not permitted to enter into the sex relationship with a woman of the same gents, but with all other women of some other gents. It is difficult for us to imagine a society in which all the men named Jones would be married to all the women named Smith. But that was the way whole races of mankind lived for many thousands of years. In that primitive communist society, the woman was generally the equal of the man. It is true that she did the drudgery of the camp, but the man, on the other hand, faced the hardships of battle and the chase on land and sea. The woman was as big as the man, and except when handicapped by pregnancy, as strong as the man. She was as respected, if not more so. Her children bore her name, and were under her control, and she was accustomed to assert herself in all affairs of the tribe. In Frederick O'Brien's White Shadows in the South Seas, you may read a comical story of a journey this traveler made into the interior of one of the cannibal islands. Everywhere he was treated with courtesy and hospitality, but was embarrassed by continual offers from would-be wives. In one case, a powerful cannibal lady, whose advances he rejected, picked him up and proceeded to carry him off, and he was quite helpless in her grasp. He might have been a cannibal husband today, if it had not been for the intervention of his fellow travelers. The basis of this sex equality under primitive communism is easy to understand. 
all goods belonged to the tribe, and were shared alike according to need. Children were the tribe's most precious possession, therefore the women suffered little handicap from having a child to bear and feed. Primitive woman would bear her child by the roadside and pick it up in her arms and continue her journey, and when she needed food she did not have to beg for it. If there was food for anyone, there was food for her and her child. She did her share of the gathering and preparing of food, because that was the habit and law of her being. She had energies, and had never heard of the idea of not using them. This primitive communism generally disappears as the tribe progresses. We cannot be sure of all the stages of its disappearance, or of the causes, but in a general way we can say that it gives way before the spread of slavery. In the beginning, primitive man does not have any slaves. He does not have sufficient foresight or self-restraint for that. When he kills his enemies in battle, he builds a fire and roasts their flesh and eats them. And those whom he captures alive, he binds fast and takes with him to be sacrificed to his voodoo gods. But as he comes to more settled ways of living, and as the tribe grows larger, it occurs to the chiefs in battle that the captives would be glad to give their labor in return for their lives, and that it would be convenient to have some people to do the hard and dirty work. So gradually there comes to be a class at the bottom of society, and another class at the top. Those who capture the slaves and keep them at work lay claim to the products of their labor, at first better weapons and personal adornments, then separate homes for the chiefs and priests, separate gardens, separate flocks and herds, and, what more natural, separate women. This process becomes complete when the tribe settles down to agriculture and the ruling classes take possession of the land. When once the land is privately owned, classes are fixed, and class distinctions become the most prominent fact in society. And step by step as this happens, we see women beaten down from the position of the cannibal lady who could ask for the man she wanted and carry him off by force if necessary, to the position of the modern woman, who is physically weak, emotionally unstable, economically dependent, and socially repressed. You may resent such phrases, but all you have to do is to read the laws of civilized countries written into the statute books by men to define the rights and duties of women. You will see that everywhere. Before the recent feminist revolt, women were classified under the law with children and imbeciles. Maternity imposes on woman a heavy burden, and before the discovery of birth control, a burden that is continuous. For nine months she carries the child in her body, and then for a year or two she carries it in her arms or on her back, and by that time there is another child and this continues until she is broken down. Having this burden, she cannot possibly compete with the unburdened male for the possession of property. So wherever there is economic competition, wherever certain individuals or classes in the tribe or group are allowed to seize and hold the land, wherever the products of labor cease to be the community property and become private property, the objects of economic strife, then invariably and by natural process, woman comes to be placed among those who cannot protect themselves, that is, among the children and the imbeciles and the slaves. Of course, some children are well cared for, and so are some imbeciles and some slaves and some women but they are cared for as a matter of favor, not as a matter of their own power. They proceed no longer as the cannibal lady, but by adopting and cultivating the slave virtues, 
by making themselves agreeable to their masters, by flattering their masters' vanity and sensuality, in other words, by exercising what we are accustomed to call feminine charm. From early barbaric society up to the present day, we observe that there are classes of women just as there are classes of men. The position of these classes changes within certain limits, but in broad outline the conditions are fixed, and may be easily defined. There is, first of all, the ruling class woman. She must have birth. She may or may not have wealth, according as to whether the laws of that society or tribe permit her to have possessions of her own, or to inherit anything from her parents. If she has no wealth, then she will need beauty. She is the woman who is selected by the ruling class man to bear his name and his children, and to have charge of the household where these children are reared, and trained for the inheriting of their father's wealth and the carrying on of his position. This confers upon the ruling class woman great dignity, and makes her a person of responsibility. She rules not merely over the slaves of the household, but over men of inferior social classes. And in a few cases, an exceptionally able woman has become a queen and ruled over men of her own class. This ruling class woman has been known through all the ages by a special name, and the ways and customs regarding her have been studied in an entertaining book, The Lady, by Emily James Putnam. Next in privilege and position to the lady is the mistress, the woman who is selected by the ruling class man not primarily to bear his children, but to entertain and divert him. She may, of course, bear children also. In barbaric societies, and up to quite recent times, the importance of the ruling class man was indicated by the number of concubines he had and the position of these women was hardly inferior to that of the wife or queen. In the days of the French monarchy, the king's mistress was frequently more important than the queen. She was a woman of ability, maintaining her supremacy in the intrigues of the court. In ancient Greek society, the heteri were a recognized class, and Aspasia, the mistress of Pericles, was the most brilliant and most conspicuous woman in Athens. In modern France, the position of the mistress is recognized by the phrase demimonde, or half-world. The American plutocracy has developed upon a superstructure of Puritanism, and therefore in America hypocrisy is necessary. But in the great cities of America, the vast majority of the ruling class men keep mistresses before marriage, and a great many keep them afterwards. And these mistresses are coming to be more and more openly flaunted, and to acquire more and more of what is called social position. It is possible now, in the smart set, for a lady to accept the status of mistress, delicately veiled, without losing caste thereby, and actresses and other freelance women who get their start in life by taking the position of a mistress are coming more and more to be recognized as ladies, and to be received into what are called the best circles. There remains to be considered the position of lower class women. In barbarous societies, these women were very little different from slaves. They had no rights of their own, except such rights as their master, man, chose to allow them for his own convenience. They were sold in marriage by their parents, and they went where they were sold, and obeyed their new master. They became his household drudges, and reserved their affections for him. If they failed to do this, he stoned them to death, or strangled them with a cord, and tied them in a sack, and threw them into the river. And, of course, the rights of the master man yielded to the rights of the men of higher classes. The king or nobleman could take any woman he wished at any time, and he made laws to this effect and enforced them. 
in feudal society the lord of the manor claimed the right of the first night with the wives of his serfs this was one of the ruling class privileges which was abolished in the french revolution wherever the french revolution did not succeed in affecting land tenure the right of the landowner to prey upon his tenant and girls continues as a custom even though it is not written in the law and would be denied by the hypocritical it prevails in poland as you may discover by reading sienkiewicz's whirlpools it prevails in england as you may discover from hardy's tests of the d'urbeville you will find that it prevails in every part of the world where women have poverty and men have wealth and prestige dress suits and automobiles you will find it wherever there are leisure class hotels or colleges or other gatherings of ruling class young males you will find it in the theatrical and moving picture worlds it is well understood in the theatrical world of broadway that the woman star in the profession gets her start in life by becoming the mistress of a manager or angel in the moving picture world of southern california it is a recognized convention known to everyone familiar with the business that a young girl parts with her virtue in exchange for an important job end of chapter twenty nine Chapters 30 and 31 of the Book of Life by Upton Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 30 Sex and Young America discusses present day sex arrangements as they affect the future generation. Our first task is to consider how people actually behave in the matter of sex as distinguished from the way they pretend to behave. The first and most necessary step in the cure of any disease is a correct diagnosis, and in this case we have not merely to make the diagnosis, but to prove it, because the most conspicuous fact about our present sex arrangements is a mass of organized concealment. Not merely do teachers and preachers, for the most part, suppress all mention of these subjects, but the defenders of our present economic disorder are accustomed to acclaim the private property regime as the only basis of family life. So long as people hold such an idea, there is no use trying to teach them anything on the subject. There is no use talking to them about monogamous love, because all they understand is hypocrisy. In this chapter, therefore, we shall proceed to hold up the mirror in front of capitalist morality. I pause and consider. Where shall I begin? At the top of society or at the bottom? With the city or the country? With the old or the young? I think you care most of all about your boys and girls, so I am going to tell you what is happening to the youth of America in these days of triumphant reaction. I have a son, about whom naturally I think a great deal. Just now he is a student at one of our state universities, and he wrote me the other day, I went to a dance, and believe me, father, if you knew what these modern dances mean, you would write something about them. I know what they mean. They have come to us straight from the brothels of the Argentine, among the vilest haunts of vice in the world. Others have come from the jungle, where they were natural. The poor creature of the jungle has his sex desire and nothing else. He is not troubled with brains. He does not have a complicated social organism to build up and protect. Consequently, he does not need what are called morals. But we civilized people need morals, and we are losing them. And our society is disintegrating, going back to the howling and fighting and cannibalism of the jungle. Professor William James, America's greatest psychologist, tells us that going through the motions 
appropriate to an emotion automatically causes that emotion to be felt. If you watch an actor preparing to rush on the stage in an emotional scene, you will see him walking about, clenching his fists, stamping his feet, making ferocious faces, working himself up. And now, what do you think is going on in the minds of young men and women, while with their bodies they are going through procedures which are nothing and can be nothing but imitations of sexual contact? The parents, it appears, are ignorant and unsophisticated and have left it for their children to find out what these dances mean. In Rhode Island, one of our oldest states is Brown College, chosen by New England's aristocracy for the education of its sons. And these boys go to social affairs in the best homes in Providence, and they call them petting parties. And here's what they write in their college paper. The modern social bud drinks not too much, often, but enough. She smokes unguardedly, swears considerably, and tells dirty stories. All in all, she is a most frivolous, passionate, sensation-seeking little thing. This statement, published in a college paper, causes a scandal, and a newspaper reporter goes to interview the college boy who edits the paper, and this boy talks. He tells how he met a lovely girl at a dance, and his heart was thrilled with the rapture of young love. Frankly, between you and me, I was pretty smitten with this particular little lady. Felt about her, don't you know, like a real guy feels about a girl he could imagine himself married to. Thought she was too nice to touch, almost. You know the grave sort of love affair a man always has once in a lifetime. Well, we talked a bit, and I guess I didn't say much. For a while, I felt plenty, respectfully, just the same. And as we turned the corner of one of the buildings here, she grasped my hand. Hers was trembling. Love and let love is my motto, dearie, said this seraph of my dreams. Come, we're losing a lot of time getting started. That girl thought I was dead slow. She didn't know that just then I imagined the great love of my life was just entering the door. It was cruel the way she got down from the pedestal I had built for her. Suppose I should ask you to name the influence that is having most to do with shaping the thoughts of young America. What would you answer? Undoubtedly, the moving pictures. It is from the movies that your children learn what life is. If I can show you that a certain thing is in the movies, you can surely not deny that it is passing every day and night into the hearts and minds of millions of our boys and girls. Take a vote among the girls. What would they consider the most delightful destiny in life? Surely nine out of ten would answer to become a screen star and pose before a world of admirers and be paid a million dollars a year. Make a test and see, and put that fact together with the one I have already stated, that in order to get an important job in the movies, a girl must regularly, and as a matter of course, part with her virtue. You will be told, no doubt, that this is a slanderous statement, so let me give you a little evidence. I happened within the past year to be in the private office of a well-known moving picture producer a man who is married and takes care to tell you that he loves his wife. He was producing a play, the heroine of which was supposed to be a daughter of Puritan New England. To play this part, he had engaged a chaste girl, and as a result was in the midst of a queer trouble, which he poured out to me. His leading man had refused to act with this girl, insisting that no girl could act a part of love unless she had had passionate experience. No such thing had ever been heard of in moving pictures before. Likewise, the director agreed that no girl who is chaste could act for the screen, and the producer asked my advice about it. Mr. William Allen White of Kansas was present in the office, and authorizes me to state that he substantiates this anecdote. 
we both advised the producer to stand by the girl, and he did so, and the picture went out and proved to be what in trade parlance is termed a frost. That is to say, your children didn't care for it, and it cost the producer something like a hundred thousand dollars to make this attempt to defy the conventions of the moving picture world. I will tell you another story. I have a friend, a prominent man in Los Angeles, who was appealed to by a young lady who wished to act in the movies. My friend introduced this young lady to a very prominent screen actor, who in turn introduced her to one of the biggest producers in America, one of the men whose million-dollar feature pictures are regularly exploited. The producer examined the young lady's figure and told her that she would do he added, quite casually, and as a matter of course, that she would be expected to pay the price. The young lady took exception to this proposition, and gave up the chance. She told my friend about it, and he, being a man of the world, accustomed to dealing with the foibles of his fellow men, wrote a note to the actor, explaining that, inasmuch as this young lady had been socially introduced to him, and by him socially introduced to the manager, she should not have been expected to pay the price. To this, the actor answered that my friend was correct, and he would see the manager about it. The manager conceded the point, and the young lady got her chance in the movies, and made good without paying the price. This story tells you all you need to know about the difference in sex ethics that society applies to the lady and to the daughter of common people. You know, of course, what is the stock theme of all moving pictures, the virtuous daughter of the people who resists all temptations and is finally rescued from her would-be seducer by the strong and sturdy arm of a male doll. Could one ask a more perfect illustration of capitalist hypocrisy than the fact that the girl who plays this role is required to pay with her virtue for the privilege of playing it? And if you knew anything about young girls, you can watch her playing it on the screen and see from her every gesture that what I am telling you is true. My wife knows young girls, and I took her the other day to see a moving picture. She said, I have solved a problem. When I come home on the streetcars, it happens that I ride with a lot of young girls from the high school. I have been watching them, and I couldn't imagine what was the matter with them. All simple, girlish straightforwardness has gone out of them. They are making eyes in the strangest manner, and at nobody. Just practicing, apparently. They wear yearning facial expressions. When they start to walk, they do not walk, but writhe and wiggle. I thought there must be some nervous eye and lip disease got abroad in the school, but now, when I go to a moving picture, I discover what it means. They are imitating the stars on the screen. In these pictures, you know, there are ingenue, young girls engaged in making a happy ending to the story by capturing a rich lover. And then there are vamps, engaged in seducing young men or breaking up some happy home. In old-style melodrama, it was possible to tell the ingenue from the vamps. The former would trip lightly and glance coyly out of the corners of their eyes, while the vamp moved with slow, languished, writhing, blinking, heavy-lidded, sinister eyes. But nowadays, the vamps have learned to post as ingenue, and the ingenue are as vicious as the vamps, they both make the same glances and culminate in the same sensual swoon. It is all sex and nothing else, except revolvers and fighting and wild rushing about. And then, too, there are the musical comedies, made wholly out of sex, being known as girl shows, or more frankly still, leg shows. A row of half-naked women prancing and gyrating on the stage, and in front of them rows of bald-headed old men gazing at them greedily. Also college boys, or boys too imbecile to get through college, sending in their cards with boxes of costly flowers. 
You will be shocked as you read my plain statements of fact, but if you are the average American, you will take your family to a musical show which has come straight from the brothels of Paris, every illusion of which is obscene. I remember once being in a small town in the South when one of these road shows arrived from New York, and I realized that this institution was simply a traveling house of ill fame. The whole male portion of the town was a quiver with excitement, a mixture of lust and fear. I live in Southern California, one of the many places in America where the idle rich gather for their diversion. The country is dotted with palatial hotels, and a golden flood of pleasure-seekers come in every winter. I have talked with some of the college boys in this part of the country, and also with teachers who try to save the boys. They report these swell hotels as hotbeds of vice, haunted by married women with automobiles and nothing to do, who wish to go into the canyons for sexual riots. Even elderly women, white-haired women, old enough to be your grandmother. I have had them pointed out to me in these hotels, their cheeks and lips covered with rouge, with pink silk tights on their calves, and nothing else, almost up to their knees, and nothing at all halfway down their backs. These old women seek to prey on boys, wanting their youth, and being willing to lavish money upon them. They are preying on your boys, you prosperous businessmen, who have preached the gospel of each for himself, and are proud of your skill to prey upon society. You heap up your fortunes and call it success, and are secure and happy. You have made your children safe against want, you think. But how are you going to make them safe against the vamps who prey upon the overwhelming excitements of youth and betray your sons before your very eyes, teaching them lust in their youth, so that love may never be born in their stunted hearts. All the haunts of gilded vice are thriving, and somebody's boy is paying the interest on the capital, to say nothing of paying the police. Many years ago I paid a call upon Anthony Comstock, head of the Society for the Prevention of Vice. Comstock was an old-style Puritan, and many insist that he was likewise an old-style grafter. However that may be, he had a collection of literature of pornography which would cause any man to hesitate in condemning his activities. There is a vast traffic in this kind of thing. It is sold by pack peddlers all over the country, and it is sold in little shops in the neighborhood of public schools you may be sure that in your school there are some boys who know where to get it, even though they will not tell what they know. I will describe just one piece that a schoolboy brought to me, a catalog of obscene literature for sale in Spain, and to be ordered wholesale. You know how men with wares to sell will expend their imaginations and exhaust their vocabulary in describing to you the charms of each particular article for sale? Here was a catalogue of one or two hundred pages listing thousands of items, pictures, pamphlets and books, and various implements of vice, all set forth in that imitation ecstasy of department stores and seed catalogues. Here was something neat. Here was a fancy one. This one was a peach. And that one was a winner. When I was a lad, I was tramping in the Adirondack Mountains and was picked up by an itinerant photographer. We rode all day together, and he became friendly and showed me some obscene pictures. Presently, he discovered that he was dealing with a young moralist, and apparently it was the first time he had ever had that experience. He talked honestly, and we became friends on a different basis. This man had a wife and children at home. But he traveled all over the mountains, and was like the sailor with a girl in every port. Also, he was thoroughly familiar with all forms of unnatural vice, and took this also as a matter of course, and spread it on his journeys. The other day I read a statement by a prominent physician in New York. 
he had been talking with a police captain and had asked him to state what in his opinion was the most significant development in the social life of new york the answer was the spread of male prostitution here is a subject to which i have to admit my courage is unequal i cannot repeat the jokes which i have heard young men tell about these matters and about the attitude of the police to them suffice it to say that these hideous forms of vice are now the commonplace of the underworld of all our great cities the other day a friend of mine was talking with a prostitute who had left a high-class resort where the price charged was ten dollars and gone to live in a fifty-cent house frequented by sailors she was asked the reason and her explanation was the sailors are natural dr william j robinson has written in his magazine an account of the haunts in berlin which are frequented by the victims of unnatural vice there allowed to meet openly and to solicit frank harris in his life of oscar wilde tells how when that scandal was at its height and further exposure threatened swarms of the most prominent men in england suddenly discovered that it was advisable for them to travel on the continent the great public schools of england are rotten with these practices the younger boys learn them from the older ones and are victims all the rest of their lives and the corruption is creeping through our own social body and you think that all you have to do is not to know about it my friend floyd dell reading this manuscript insists that this chapter and the one following are too severe in case others should agree with him i quote two newspaper items which appear while i am reading the proofs the first is from an interview with h gordon selfridge the london merchant telling his impressions of america he tells about the flappers and then about the shifters the other is the newly exploited shifters the shifters are an organization of mushroom growth among high school girls and boys which is spreading through the eastern states and winning converts among youngsters it is described as the flapper ku klux and its emblem if worn by a girl according to high school teachers and children's society leaders who oppose it to be nothing more or less than an invitation to be kissed to call it an organization even is an exaggeration for the shifters are better described as a secret understanding without any responsible head from being a seemingly harmless group whose emblem was originally a brass paper clip fastened in the coat lapel it has developed by rapid strides manufacturers of emblems are coining money by the sale of hands palm outstretched the significance is to take what you want or as the motto of the order says be a good fellow get something for nothing one of the principles is to do one's parents referred to as they the second item is an associated press dispatch st louis march 10 in reiterating his statements that a girls and boys secret organization requiring that all applicants must have violated the moral code before admission was granted existed in a local high school victor j miller president of the board of police commissioners tonight named the solden high school as the one in which the alleged immoral conditions exist the school is attended largely by children of the wealthy west end citizens end of chapter thirty chapter thirty one sex and the smart set portrays the moral customs of those who set the fashion in our present-day world we have discussed what is happening to our young people let us next consider what our mature people are doing having mentioned conditions in england i will give a glimpse of london high life two years before the war as a visiting writer i was invited to luncheon at the home of a woman novelist whose books at that time were widely read both in her country and here present at the luncheon was a prominent publisher who i afterwards learned was the lady's lover also the lady's grown and married son the publisher looked like a buxom hunting squire 
but the lady told me that he was very unhappy because his wife would not divorce him the lady had just come from a weekend party at the home of an earl who at this moment occupies one of the highest posts in the gift of the british empire things had gone comically wrong at this country house party she said because the hostess had failed to remember that lord so-and-so was at present living with lady somebody else one of the duties of the hostesses at house parties it appears is to know who is living with whom in order that they may be put in connecting rooms in this case his lordship had been grouchy and everybody's pleasure had been spoiled this produced a discussion of the subject of marriage and the son remarked that marriage was like an old slipper you wore it because you had got used to it but you did not talk about it because it was unimportant and stupid i went away and happened to mention these matters to a friend who had met this woman novelist in nice the novelist had there in a group of people been introduced to a young girl who was suffering from neurasthenia my dear said the novelist affectionately what you need is to have an illegitimate baby this you will say is the old world and you always knew that it was corrupt if so let me tell you a few things that i have seen among the upper circles of our own great and virtuous democracy my first acquaintance with new york society came after the publication of the jungle as the author of that book i was a sensation almost as much so as if i had won the heavyweight championship of the world out of curiosity i accepted an invitation for a weekend amid what is called the hunting set of long island here was a gorgeous palace with many tapestries and soft-footed servants and decanters and cocktails at every stage of one's journey about the place like coaling stations on the trade routes of the british empire one of the first sights that caught my young eye was a large and stately lady in semi-undress smoking a big black cigar if i were to mention her name every newspaper reader in america would know her and before i had been introduced to her i heard two young men in evening dress make an obscene remark about her and what she was waiting for that evening i discovered quickly while there was a great deal of sex among these people there was very little love there was principally a wish to score cleverly and subtly at the expense of another person's feelings it is called the smart set you understand and i will give you an idea of how smart it is i was walking down a passage with a lady and on a couch sat another lady side by side with a certain very famous lawyer whose golden eloquence you have probably listened to from platforms and whom for the purpose of this anecdote i will name jones mr jones and the lady on the sofa were sitting very close together and my companion with a bright smile over her shoulder called out be careful mary you'll be scattering a lot of little joneses around here if you don't watch out quite continental you perceive and a long way from the puritanism of our ancestors from there i went to the billiard room and observed a young man of fashion trying to play billiards when he was half drunk it was a funny spectacle and they took away his cigarette by force for fear he would drop it on the cloth of the billiard table pretty soon he was telling about a racing meet and an orgy with a negro woman in a stable therefore i returned to where the ladies were gathered and one middle-aged matron who had read widely including some of my books engaged me in serious conversation i came later on to know her rather well and she told me her views of love the source of all the sex troubles of humanity was that they took the relationship seriously modern discoveries made it unnecessary to attach importance to it she herself acting upon this theory probably had relations with my friends reading the proofs of this book begged me to omit the number of men because you would not believe me you may argue that it is not typical say that i fell into the clutches of some particular group of degenerates all i can tell you is that these people are as socially prominent as any in new york city 
I will say furthermore that I have sat in the home of the best-known corporation lawyer in America, who has paid a million dollars to organize the Steel Trust, the late James B. Dill, at that time a member of the Court of Appeals of New Jersey, and have heard him muckrake his business friends by the hour with stories of that sort. I have heard him tell of the steel crowd hiring a trolley car and a load of prostitutes and champagne, and taking an all-night trip from one city to another, smashing up both the car and the prostitutes. I have heard him tell of sitting on the deck of a sound steamer, and overhearing two of his Wall Street associates and their wives arranging to trade partners for the night. I have mentioned a lady who had a great many lovers once in the dining room of a club on Fifth Avenue, commonly known as the Millionaires. A companion pointed out various people, many of whom I had read about in the newspapers, and told me funny stories about them. "'See that old boy with the notebook?' said my host. "'That is Jacob so-and-so, and he is entering up the cost of his lunch. He keeps accounts of everything, even his women.' He told me that he had had over a thousand, and that they had cost him over a million. It is impossible to say what is the most terrible thing in capitalist society, but among the most terrible are assuredly the old men. The richest and most powerful banker in America was in his sex habits the merry jest of New York society. He took toward women the same attitude as King Edward the Seventh. If he wanted one, he went up and asked for her, and it made no difference who she was or where she was. This man's personal living expenses were $5,000 a day, and all women understood that they might have anything within reason. When I was a boy living in New York, there was a certain aged moneylender about whom one read something in the newspapers almost every day. He was a prominent figure because he was worth 80 millions yet wore an old rusty black suit and saved every penny. Every now and then you would read in the paper how some woman had been arrested for attempting to blackmail him in his office. It seemed puzzling, because you wouldn't think of him as a likely subject for blackmail. Some years later I met Dorothy Richardson, author of The Long Day, a very fine book which has been undeservedly forgotten. Miss Richardson had been a reporter for the New York Herald, and had been sent to interview this old money-lender. She was ushered into his private office, and as soon as the attendant had gone out and closed the door, the old man came up and without a word of preliminaries grabbed her in his arms like a gorilla. She fought and scratched, and got out, and was wise enough to say nothing about it. Therefore there was nothing published about another attempt to blackmail the aged moneylender. What this means is that men of unlimited means live lives of unbridled lust, and then in their old age they are helpless victims of their own impulses. There was a certain enormously wealthy United States senator from West Virginia who came very near to being vice president of the United States. This doddering old man would go about the streets of Washington with a couple of very decorous and carefully trained attendants, and whenever an attractive young woman would pass on the street, or when one would approach the senator, these two attendants would quietly slip their arms into his and hold him fast. They would do this so that the ordinary person would not suspect what was going on, but would think the old man was being supported. You do not have to take these things on my word. The newspapers are full of them all the time, and they are proven in court. Just now as I write, the president of the most powerful bank in America is claiming in court that his children are not his own, but that their father is an Indian guide. His wife, on the other hand, is accusing the banker of having played the role of husband to several other women. He would take these women traveling on his yacht, which quaintly enough, was termed the modesty. Also the papers have been full of the Hammond case. Here is a wealthy man, Republican National Committeeman from Oklahoma, who is about to go to Washington to advise our new president whom to appoint to office from that state. 
before he goes he casts off his mistress and she shoots him she was his secretary it appears and helped him to make his fortune she has made many friends and a million dollars is spent to save her life the prosecuting attorney calls her a painted snake and accuses her of having sat week after week displaying to the jury twenty-four inches of silk stockinged shinbone. The jury, apparently unable to withstand this allurement, acquits the woman, and she announces that she intends to bring suit under the man's will to get his money. Also, she is going into the movies, and tells us that it is to be for educational purposes. Everything in our capitalist society must be educational, you understand. It was P. T. Barnum who discovered that the American people would flock to look at a five legged calf if it was presented as educational. The moving pictures and the theaters are the honey pots which gather the feminine beauty and youthful charm of our country for the convenience of rich men's lust. These girls swarm in the theatrical agencies and in the artist studios. They starve for a while and finally they yield. In every great city there are thousands of men of wealth whose only occupation is to prey upon such girls. I know a certain theatrical manager, the most famous in the United States, a sensual, stout little Jew. He is a man of culture and subtle insight, and in the course of his conversation he described to me quite casually, and as a matter of course, the charm of deflowering a virgin nothing could equal that sensation the first time was the last many years ago there was a horrible scandal in new york the most famous architect in america was murdered and the newspapers probed into his life and it was revealed to us that many of the most famous artists and men about town in new york maintained elaborate studios equipped with every luxury all the paraphernalia of all the vices of the ages and through these places there flowed an endless stream of beautiful young girls. In every large city in America you will find an athletic club, and if you go there and listen to the gossip, you'll discover that there are scores of idle rich men with automobiles and private apartments and a staff of procurers used in preying, not merely upon young girls, but also upon young boys and these are not merely the children of the poor they are the children of all but the rich and powerful in the movies you see pictures of girls lured into automobiles and carried out into the country or seduced by means of knockout drops and you think this is just melodrama but it is happening all the time in every big city of our country the police know that hundreds of young girls disappear every year at a recent convention of police chiefs in Washington, it was stated from police records that 60,000 girls disappear every year in the United States, leaving no trace. Unless the parents happen to be in position to make a fuss, not even the names of the girls are published in the newspapers. I do not ask you to believe such things on my word. Believe District Attorney Sims of Chicago who made the most thorough study of this subject ever made in America, and wrote, When a white slave is sold and landed in a house or dive, she becomes a prisoner. In each of these places is a room having but one door, to which the keeper holds the keys. Here are locked all the street clothes, shoes, and ordinary apparel. The finery provided for the girls is of a nature to make their appearance on the street impossible then in addition to this handicap the girl is placed at once in debt to the keeper for a wardrobe she cannot escape while she is in debt and she can never get out of debt not many of the women in this class expect to live more than ten years perhaps the average is less many die painful deaths by disease many by consumption but it is hardly beyond the truth to say that suicide is their general expectation End of chapter 31。Chapters 32, 33, and 34 of the Book of Life by Upton Sinclair. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 32 Sex and the Poor Discusses prostitution, the extent of its prevalence, and the diseases which result from it. It is manifest that the rich cannot indulge in vices without drawing the poor after them. And in addition to this, the poor have their own evil instincts, which fester in neglect. There were several hundred thousand dark rooms, that is, rooms without light or ventilation, in New York City before the war. Now the country is reported to be short a million homes, and in New York City working girls are sleeping six or eight in a room. In the homes of the poor, in the slums, parents and children and boarders all sleep in one room indiscriminately, and the world moves back to that primitive communism in which incest is an everyday affair, and little children learn all the vices there are. I have in my hand a pamphlet by a physician in charge of a hospital in New York, who in fifteen years has examined nine hundred children who have been raped, and the age of the youngest was eight months. I have another pamphlet by a settlement worker who discusses the problem of the thousands of deserted wives, most of them with children, many with children yet unborn. As I write, there are millions of men out of work in our country, and these men are desperate, and they quit and take to the road. They join the army of the casual workers, the blanket stiffs, and, of course, the more there are of these men, the more prostitutes there have to be, and the more homosexuality there will inevitably be. Also, the girls are out of work, and are on the streets. Many years ago I visited the mill towns of New England, she-towns they are called, and one of the young fellows said to me that you could buy a girl there for the price of a sandwich. Read The Long Day, to which I have previously referred, and see how our working girls live. Dorothy Richardson describes her roommate, who read cheap novels which she found in the gutter weeklies. She read them over and over. When she had got to the bottom of the pile, she began again, because her mind was so weak that she had forgotten everything. And then one day Miss Richardson happened to be groping in a corner of a closet, and came upon a great pile of bottles, and examined them, and was made sick with horror. Abortion mixtures. Dr. William J. Robinson, an authority on the subject, estimates that there are one million abortions in the United States every year. Some of these are accidental, caused by venereal disease, but the vast majority are deliberate acts, crimes under the law, murder of human life. Dr. Robinson also estimates, from the many thousands of cases which come to him, that 95% of all men have at some time practiced self-abuse. He is a strenuous opponent of what he calls hysteria on the subjects of venereal disease, and insists that its prevalence is exaggerated, that instead of one person in ten being syphilitic, as is commonly stated, the proportion is only one in twenty. He insists that the percentage of persons having had gonorrhea is only twenty-five percent, instead of seventy-five or eighty-five. I find that other authorities generally agree in the statement that fifty percent of young men become infected with some venereal disease before they reach the age of thirty. The Committee of Seven in New York estimated in 1903 that there were two hundred thousand cases of syphilis in the city, and eight hundred thousand of gonorrhea. There were villages in France before the war in which 25% of the inhabitants were syphilitic, and in Russia there were towns in which it was said that every person was syphilitic. We may safely say that these latter are the only towns in Europe in which there was not an enormous increase of this disease during and since the war. What are the consequences of these diseases? The consequences are frightful suffering, not merely to persons guilty of immorality, 
but to innocent persons. Dr. Morrow, generally recognized as the leading authority on this subject, estimates that 10% of all wives are infected with venereal disease by their husbands. He estimates that 30% of all the infected women in New York were wives who had got the disease from their husbands. It is estimated that 30% of all births where either parent has syphilis result in abortions. It is estimated that 50% of childlessness in marriage is caused by gonorrhea and 25% of all existing blindness. In Germany, before the war, there were 30,000 persons born blind from this cause. It is estimated that 95% of all abdominal operations performed upon women are due to gonorrhea. And any of these horrors may fall upon persons who lead lives of the strictest chastity. There was a case reported in Germany of 236 children who contracted venereal disease from swimming in a public bath. All of these things are products of our system of marriage plus prostitution. They are all part of that system, and no study of the system is complete without them. Everywhere throughout modern civilization, prostitution is an enormous and lucrative industry. In New York, it is estimated to give employment to 200,000 women to say nothing of the managers and the runners and the men who live off the women. There are thousands of resorts, large and small, high-priced and cheap, and the police know all about it and derive a handsome income from it. And you find it the same in every great city of the world, in every port where sailors land, or every place where crowds of men are expected. If there is to be a football game or a political convention, the managers of the industry know about it. And while they may never have heard the libel that socialism preaches sexual license, they all know that capitalism practices it, and they provide the necessary means. In the United States, there are estimated to be a half a million prostitutes counting the inmates of houses alone. During the late war, at the army bases in France, the British government maintained official brothels, but if you published anything about this in England, you ran a chance of having your paper suppressed. During the occupation of the Rhine country, the French sent in Negro troops, savages from the heart of Africa, whose custom it is to cut off the ears of their enemies in battle, and the French army compelled the German population to supply white women for these troops. I have quoted in The Brass Check a pious editorial from the Los Angeles Times, bidding the mothers of America to be happy because our boys in France were safe in the protecting arms of the YMCA and the Knights of Columbus. I dared not publish at this time a passage which I had clipped from the London Clarion, in which A. M. Thompson told how he watched the doughboys in the cafes of Paris with a girl on each knee and a glass of wine in each hand. I will add one little anecdote, giving you a glimpse of the sex conventions of war. The American army made desperate efforts to keep down venereal disease and required all men to report to their regimental surgeon immediately after having had sex relations. Our army moved into Koblenz, and the regulations strictly forbade any fraternizing with the inhabitants. But immediately it was discovered that there was an increase of disease, an investigation was made and revealed that men had been ceasing to report to the surgeons because they were afraid of being punished for having fraternized with the enemy. So a new order was issued, providing that having sexual intercourse would not be considered as fraternizing. I do not know any better way to distinguish my ideal of morality from the military ideal than to say that, according to my understanding of it, the sex relationship should always and everywhere imply and include fraternizing. 
Finally, in concluding this picture of our present-day sex arrangements, there is a brief word to be said about divorce. In the year 1916, the last statistics available as I write, there were just over a million marriages in the United States, and there were over 112,000 divorces. This would indicate that one marriage in every nine resulted in shipwreck. But as a matter of fact, the proportion is greater because the marriages necessarily precede the divorces, and the proportion of divorces in 1916 should be calculated upon the number of marriages which took place some five or ten years previously. Of the one million marriages in 1916, we may say that one in seven or one in eight will end in the divorce courts. Let this suffice for a glimpse of the system of marriage plus prostitution, a field of weeds which we have somehow to plow up and prepare for a harvest of rational and honest love. End of chapter 32 Chapter 33 Sex and Nature maintains that our sex disorders are not the result of natural or physical disharmony. Ailey Metchnikoff, one of the greatest scientists, wrote a book entitled The Nature of Man, in which he studied the human organism from the point of view of biology, demonstrating that in our bodies are a number of relics of past stages of evolution, no longer useful, but rather a source of danger and harm. We have, for example, in the inner corner of the eye a relic of that third eyelid whereby the eagle is enabled to look at the sun. This is a harmless relic, but we have also an appendix, a degenerate organ of digestion, or gland of secretion, which now serves as a center of infection and source of danger. We have likewise a lower bowel, a survival of our hay-eating days, and a cause of auto-intoxication and premature death. Among the sources of trouble, Metchnikoff names the fact that the human male possesses a far greater quantity of sexual energy than is required for the purposes of procreation. This becomes a cause of disharmony and excess. It causes man to wreck his health and destroy himself. Manifestly, this is a serious matter, for if it is true, our efforts to find health and happiness in love are doomed to failure. And Lecky is right when he describes the prostitute as the guardian of virtue, the eternal and necessary scapegoat of humanity. But I do not believe it is true. I think that here is one more case of the endless blundering of scientists and philosophers who attempt to teach physiology, politics, religion, and law without having made a study of economics. I do not believe that the sex troubles of mankind are physiological in their nature, but have their origin in our present system of class privilege. I believe they are caused not by the blunders of nature, but by the blunders of man as a social animal. Let us take a glimpse at primitive man. I choose the Marquesas Islands because we have complete reports about them from numerous observers. Here was a race of people, not interfered with by civilization, who manifested all that overplus of sexual energy to which Metchnikoff calls attention. They placed no restraint whatever upon sex activity. They had no conception of such an idea. Their games and dances were sex play, and so also in great part was their religion. Yet we do not find that they wrecked themselves. Physically speaking, they were one of the most perfect races of which we have record. Both the men and women were beautiful. They were active and strong from childhood to old age, and, here is the significant thing, they were happy. They were a laughing, dancing, singing race. They hardly knew grief or fear at all. They knew how to live, and they enjoyed every process and aspect of their lives, just as children do, naively and simply. 
This included their sex life, and I think it assures us that there can be no such fundamental physical disharmony in the human organism as the great Russian scientist thought he had discovered. Is it not a fact that throughout nature a superfluity of any kind of energy or product may be a source of happiness, rather than distress? Consider the singing of birds, or consider nature's impulse to cover a field with useless plants, and how, by a little cunning, we are able to turn it into a harvest for our own use. In the life of our bodies, one may show the same thing again and again. We have within us the possibility of, and the impulse toward, more muscular activity than our survival makes necessary. But we do not regard this additional energy as a curse of nature, and a peril to our lives. We turn out and play baseball. We have an impulse to see more than is necessary. So we climb mountains, or go traveling. We have an impulse to hear more. So we go to a concert. We have an impulse to think more. So we play chess or whist or write books and accumulate libraries. Never do we think of these activities as signs of an irrevocable blunder on the part of nature. But about the activities of love, we feel differently. And why is this? If I say that it is because we have an unwholesome and degraded attitude toward love, because as a result of religious superstition we fear it and dare not deal with it honestly, the reader may suspect that I am preparing to hint at some self-indulgence, some form of sex orgy, such as the turkey trot and the bunny hug and the grizzly bear, the shimmy and the toddle and the cuddle. I hasten to explain that I do not mean any of the abnormalities and monstrosities of present-day fashionable life. Neither do I mean that we should set out to emulate the happy cannibals in the South Seas. In the Book of the Mind, I set forth as carefully as I knew how the difference between nature and man, the life of instinct and the life of reason. It is my conviction that if civilized life is to go on, there must be a far wider extension of judgment and self-control in human affairs. Our lost happiness will be found, not by going back to nature, but by going forward to a new and higher state, planned by reason and impelled by moral idealism. But we find ourselves face to face with horrible sex disorders, and a great scientist tells us they are nature's tragic blunder, of which we are the helpless victims. Manifestly, the way to decide this question is to go to nature and see if primitive people, having the same physical organism as ours, had the same troubles and spent their lives in the same misery. If they did, then it may be that we are doomed. But if they did not, then we can say with certainty that it is not nature, but ourselves who have blundered. Our task, then, becomes to apply reason to the problem, to take our present sex arrangements, our field of bad-smelling weeds, and plow it thoroughly, and sow it with good seed, and raise a harvest of happiness and love. It is my belief that, admitting true love, honest and dignified and rational love, it is possible to pour into it any amount of sex energy, to invent a whole new system of beautiful and happy love play. End of chapter 33 Chapter 34 Love and Economics Maintains that our sex disorders are of social origin due to the displacing of love by money as a motive in mating. If the cause of our sex disorders is not physiological, what is it? Everything in nature must have a cause, and this includes human nature. The actions and feelings of men, both as individuals and as groups. We hear the saying, you can't change human nature. But the fact is that human nature is one of the most changeable things in the world. 
we can watch it changing from age to age for better or for worse and if we had the intelligence to use the forces now at our command we could mold human nature as precisely as a brewer converts a carload of hops into a certain brand of beer voltaire was the author of the saying vice and virtue are products like vinegar our civilization is based upon industrial exploitation and class privilege the monopoly of the means of production and the natural sources of wealth by a group this enables the privileged group to live in idleness upon the labor of the rest of society it confers unlimited power with practically no responsibility a strain which not one human being in a thousand has the moral strength to endure history for the past five thousand years is one demonstration after another that the conferring upon a class of power without responsibility means the collapse of that class and the downfall of its civilization so far as concerns the ruling class male what the system of privilege does is to give him unlimited ability to indulge his sex desires what it does for the female is to submit her to the male desires and to abolish that mutuality in sex that interaction between male and female influence which is the very essence of its purpose woman in a predatory society is subject to a double enslavement that of class as well as of sex and the result is the perverting of sexual selection and a constantly increasing tendency towards the survival of the unfit in a state of nature the males compete among themselves for the favor of the female the female is not raped nor is she kidnapped on the contrary she exercises her prerogative she inspects the various male charms which are set before her and selects those which please her according to her deeply planted instincts the result is that the weak and unfit males seldom have the chance to reproduce themselves and the procreating is done by the highest specimens of the type but now we have a world which is ruled by money in which opportunity and indeed survival depend upon money and the whole tendency of society is to make money standards supreme we do not like to admit this of course our instincts revolt against it and our higher faculties reinforce the revolt so we carefully veil our money motives and invent polite phrases to conceal them you will hear people deny it is money which determines admission into what is called society the intimate life of the ruling class they will tell you that it is not money it is good taste refinement a charm of personality and so on but if you analyze all these things you speedily discover that they are made out of money they are symbols of the possession of money devised by those who possess it as a means of keeping themselves apart from those who do not possess it i would safely defy a member of the ruling class to name a single element in what he calls refinement or good taste that is not in its ultimate analysis a symbol of the possession of money let it be the pronunciation of a word or the cut of a coat or the method of handling a fork whatever it may be it is part of a code revealing that the person or more important yet the ancestors of the person have belonged to the leisure class and have had time and opportunity to learn to do things in a certain precise conventional way i say conventional for very frequently these tests have no relationship whatever to reality considered as a matter of common sense and convenience it is a great deal better to eat peas with a spoon and with a fork and to use both a knife and fork in eating lettuce but if you eat peas with a spoon or use a knife on lettuce every member of the ruling class will instantly know that you are an interloper 
as much so as if you took to throwing the china at your hostess. Our culture is a money culture. Our standards are money standards, and our sex decisions are based upon money, not upon love. Any man can have money in our society, provided the accident of birth favors him, and it is everywhere known that any man who has money can get a wife. It is certainly not true that any man with no money can get a wife, and it is true that most men who have little money have to take wives who have less, that is, who belong to a lower class, according to the world's standards. The average young girl of the property classes is trained for marriage as for any other business. She is taught to be sexually cold, but to imitate sexual excitement deliberately so as to arouse it in the male and to keep herself surrounded with a swarm of males, this being the basis of her prestige, the factor which will cause the eligible man, the catch, to desire her. In polite society, this proceeding is known as coquetry, or charm, and it would be no exaggeration to say that 75% of all the novels so far written in the world are expositions of this activity also that when we go to the theater we go in order to watch and sympathize with these manifestations of pecuniary sexuality as a rule the young girl knows what she is doing but she is taught to camouflage it to preserve her innocence she would not dream of marrying for money she wants to marry something distinguished that is to say something which has received the stamp of approval from a world which approves money. She wants to marry somebody who is elegant, who is in good form. She wants to marry without having to think about the horrid subject of money at all, and so she is carefully chaperoned and confined to a world where nothing but money is to be met. In Tennyson's poem, The Northern Farmer, the old fellow is coaching his son on the subject of marriage, and they are driving along a road, and the farmer listens to his horse's hooves, and they are saying, property, property, property. The farmer sums up in one sentence the doctrine of pecuniary marriage as it is taught to the ruling class virgin. Done thee marry for money, but go where money is. In this process, of course, the ruling class virgin must spend a great deal of money in order to keep up her own prestige, and when she is married she must spend it to keep up the prestige of her unmarried sisters and then of her children. As a result of this, the only ruling class males who can afford to marry are the rich ones. There are always some who are richer, and these are the most desirable, so the tendency with each generation is to put the period of marriage further off. The man has to wait until he has accumulated enough property to satisfy the girl of his desires, a girl whom he admires because of her pecuniary prestige. He delays, and meantime he satisfies his passions with the daughters of the poor. As a result of this, when he does finally come to marry, he is apt to be unlovely and unlovable. The woman frequently does not love him at all, but takes him cold-bloodedly because he is eligible. In that case, she is a cold and sexless wife. Or else, after she has married him, she discovers his unloveliness and either decides that all men are selfish brutes and reconciles herself to a celibate life, or she goes out and preys upon the domestic happiness of other women. End of chapter 34